Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's uh, Cleopatra workshop. This is the third uh, workshop on cross-lingual event-centric open analytics. Uh, my name is Talena Zemedova. I will uh, chair through the first session today. And uh, then um, also in this room is Shersad Hakarimov. So he is co-organizer of the workshop. So he will then chair the second half of the workshop. And um, yeah, let's start. Um, Jenny, can you let people in if someone is appearing? Because it's uh, difficult to. Yes, I will manage that. No uh, thank you very much. Okay, I think that the room is. Uh, yeah, we get more participants. Um, and that's very good to see. So maybe we start first a little bit with the motivation of this workshop series. And um, then I will show you a little bit of today's program and then we will go over to the talks. Uh, can you hear me well? Okay. So first of all, it's um, there are many examples today, like why this uh, topic is very up to date, why it's very important. We have large variety of events which have global impact. Uh, just uh, here, it's a small interface showing examples of events related to Brexit. And when we think about these events, and we see that the perception and the impact vary across communities, across languages, across language communities and uh, people around us in different countries. But still, uh, there is lack of methods to facilitate analysis of these events at scale, to understand if you don't speak the target language, uh, how these events is per are perceived or um, how they are discussed in different communities. And uh, this was the initial motivation for us to start uh, not only this workshop series, but also we have a project behind it. This is also called Cleopatra Project. This is a Marie Curie um, training network, which uh, also co-organizes uh, this workshop series. So just to summarize the challenges a little bit, so on the one hand, we have language barriers, we have fragmentation, which is also due to it because information is uh, fragmented and uh, it's difficult to understand it and to analyze it across languages. It also the problem is the underdeveloped cross-lingual technology because you have languages which have lots of support with resources for natural language processing, like English, which is very easy nowadays to analyze this type of information. But we have also lots of other resource languages in Europe and beyond where NLP technologies are difficult, where knowledge graphs are not so well developed, where it's very difficult to process and understand this information. And uh, we want to facilitate and support development of technology which facilitates this analytics at scale across different languages to have intuitive user access to help avoiding information overload and to facilitate analytics and cross-lingual studies, also supporting digital humanities researchers who want to uh, handle and understand and analyze this information. So as I mentioned, we also have a project, which is the Marie Skolodowska Curie Innovation Innovative Training Network. It's still running till uh, it started 2019 and around to the next year. We have 15 PhD students across eight partner organizations uh, around Europe who develop these technologies. And today in this workshop, we will also see invited talks from our researchers who uh, show their current developments and highlights of their research very briefly. I would also like to advertise a little bit the knowledge graphs which we developed in our team because I think this is for me personally the only possibility in this workshop to show something from the development we have, but it will also be shown later in the talks. Um, we have developed an event knowledge graph, event KG, which is openly available. Everybody can use it. So if you're interested in analyzing event-centric information in different languages, this is definitely a very interesting resource to look into the systematically extracted information from um, different languages in Wikipedia, in Yago, in Wikipedia, in Wikidata. And we have now over 1.3 million events and many more relations in 15 languages. So please uh, have a look, explore it. It's a good resource for interesting starting point for many studies. 
uh, the organization of this workshop, I would like to uh, thank our organization committee and also our program committee to facilitating the review process to supporting us. We also um, very international uh, program committee here and also interdisciplinary one because we involve computer scientists but we also involve digital humanities researchers in this project and this workshop series thank you very much for supporting us and of course as uh, you can imagine this type of topic captures many disciplines uh, so we have natural language processing topics of interest we have knowledge graphs which are relevant to capture event centric information semantic way making it accessible uh, we need multimodal event representations including not only text but also multimedia information images and uh, we also work on event-centric analytics and all of these are of course topics of interest for our workshop today uh, regarding the statistics so we received uh, one and uh, accepted one paper and we are very much looking forward to the presentation today from sebastian Ryman and uh, sarah stumna about exploring cross-lingual transfer to contract data scarcity for casualty detection. We also have uh, invited talks by the early stage researchers of uh, Cleopatra Aitin. So as I mentioned, this is the third edition of the workshop. The first one we started in the series was 2020, co-located with the Extended Semantic Web Conference. And last year, we had a Cleopatra workshop co-located uh, with a web conference as well. So today's program is we will start with a keynote and uh, we will have research presentations in the first part and there is a coffee break and then there will be second part of the research presentations and the closing session. Uh, if you would like to have a look at the program in more detail, also please visit our homepage. So and uh, then it's my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker. Our keynote speaker today is Professor Manolis Varakis from National and Kapodistrian University of Athens, Greece. Uh, Manolis is professor and director of graduate studies. He is leader of artificial intelligence team, and uh, he is also a fellow of European Association for Artificial Intelligence and president of president of the Hellenic Association for Artificial Intelligence. Manolis does a lot of interesting, exciting research in artificial intelligence, in particular the knowledge representation and databases and semantic web. And um, what is um, more related to his topic today, the presentation today is uh, his research on linked geospatial data. Uh, welcome Manolis, thank you very much for joining us today. And the floor is yours. <laughs> Okay, Elena, thank you very much. Maybe you have to unshare. No, I can share my screen. I can say yes here. Okay, now I trust you see my screen uh, in full screen mode. Um, so thank you very much for uh, inviting me and for the informative introduction. Thank you, Elena. Thank you, Sherzot. Uh, um, so I will talk today about geospatial interlinking, um, geospatial only, unfortunately. So you're not going to see things about events, um, but but since uh, this uh, workshop has a lot of participants that are uh, researchers in their early career stages, maybe they can take up this theme and apply it to um, um, geospatial and temporal and event-based uh, interlinking uh, in the sense that one can imagine interesting applications of this uh, idea as well. For example, um, you might want to know things that um, uh, link to events that took place in Lyon uh, immediately after uh, the end of the Second World War. Uh, so you have the temporal uh, dimension, you have the event dimension, and you have the geospatial dimension. Uh, 
Um, so I will present to you a lot of things that are state of the art in the area of geospatial interlinking, and hopefully you can do the rest uh, with respect to events and time. Um, so why geospatial data? Um, I guess uh, this is, um, uh, I mean, it's kind of obvious. We have a lot of geospatial data around. Places like um, uh, Google Maps, uh, here, uh, OpenStreetMap. Um, there are also geospatial agencies like the Ordnance Survey in the United Kingdom or the Cadaster in the Netherlands that offer linked uh, geospatial data. Uh, so there is lots of interesting data sets that um, one can play with, and this is the motivation for us, the, the primary motivation. Another um, um, dimension that we have explored of the spatial data that we have explored over the years is Earth observation data, data from satellites that, of course, have um, also uh, your special dimension and uh, satellite data are important these days uh, all over the world. Uh, for example, in the United States with the Landsat program, uh, in Europe with the Copernicus program. Uh, and over the years, my team has worked basically on this um, uh, data science pipeline and the work on Jedi Spatial that I will be presenting to you today uh, is, is part of the uh, work that we have done. Um, so, so let me uh, spend a second explaining this pipeline. Uh, so initially, uh, one has data coming from a satellite arriving at the ground segment where it is ingested, it is processed, and then some products are produced that are cataloged and archived. Then somebody may, might come up uh, to discover a data set, process the data set to extract knowledge from it. Um, let's say that um, we have an application that has to do with uh, agriculture and maybe what we would like to discover uh, from a satellite image, from a processed satellite image, is the kinds of corps that, uh, uh, crops, sorry, not corps, um, so the kinds of crops that uh, exist in an area. Uh, I mean, whether you have, let's say, corn or you have potatoes or uh, something like that, um, and then um, uh, transform this information into RTF, um, uh, stored, stored as linked data. So this transformation, for this transformation, we have a tool called GeoTriples. Then once this becomes RTF, then it can be interlinked with the Jedi technologies, Jedi spatial that I will be showing you today. It can be published on the web. It can also be stored, uh, queried, and maybe you can answer even um, questions expressed in natural language over it. And finally, you might want to um, uh, explore, browse, and visualize this with uh, the various technologies that we have. So we have a lot of work in this area that you might want to look up, uh, but I'm going to talk about Jedi Spatial today. So here's an example uh, of geospatial interlinking in action uh, in the context of satellite data. What you see here is you see satellite images being taken in the Arctic Circle. So the satellite images are the, uh, the red uh, polygons, and then the gray circles are um, observations from vessels in the Arctic, and you want to interlink these and see how they are related. Maybe you would like to use the uh, observations as ground truth for uh, uh, things that for uh, machine learning algorithms that you will run on the satellite images. Um, um, okay, so 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 much for uh, uh, motivation. Uh, let's get into our job of showing 
details of geospatial interlinking. So let's define the problem first. So the problem of geospatial interlinking is the following. Uh, we are given a topological relation. Uh, a, top, a topological relation can be something like contains, for example, in the sense that, um, let's say, Lyon contains the uh, conference building where um, the web conference is taking place this year. Okay, so uh, we are given topological relation R, a source data set of geometry says, and a target data set of geometries T. We are assuming in this work that the geometries are lines or polygons. And so, so they can be like in the example uh, here uh, to the right. And what you would like to find is to find all the pairs S comma T, S is from the source data set, T is from the target data set, such that the relationship R holds between S and T. Okay, so you want to discover, for example, that here G4, uh, if you see the picture to the right, G4 contains G3. Okay. Um, now, what kind of topological relations we consider? This is the first question. People working on geospatial data, geospatial databases, geospatial reasoning have, have over the years done a lot of work in defining such topological relations formally. They have developed a number of um, data models for that. And we are taking into account the dimensionally extended nine intersection model of Clementini and Di Felice. Um, and um, here to the left, you see um, uh, the relations that is supported, uh, that are supported by this um, framework, like equals and touches. You can see here an example of touches. Um, I'll try to see where my cursor is, but I can manage it. Um, so you can see here examples of within, examples of touches, examples of crosses, overlaps, etc. Um, and and um, there's lots of such relationships that and these calculi can be defined in various ways. And so uh, what is important to point out is that a lot of the, um, the work that is done in this area, um, uh, and this is actually uh, from where the model takes its name, is that all these relations can be defined using an intersection matrix like the one I'm showing to you here. Uh, uh, so it's a, it's a uh, three by three uh, matrix uh, where the cells in the matrix are the dimensions of the intersections of the interiors, exteriors, and boundaries of the uh, geometries. Um, so if you look at the top uh, left uh, um, corner of this matrix, you have a dimension I of A intersection I of B. So you take <laughs> you take the interior of A, you take the interior of B, you take the intersection and you take the dimension of it. And the dimension can be, let's say, two. So it's an area. Um, so once you know uh, this matrix, uh, then you are able to deduce deterministically what are the relationships that hold between A and B. So this matrix is an important tool in our work. And here are examples of such matrix matrices. Um, so for example, uh, at the top uh, left, um, you see um, uh, the matrix for equals, then you see various matrices that correspond to intersects, then matrices for overlaps and so on. Uh, now, 
coming back to geospatial interlinking. Why is it a difficult problem? Uh, because uh, you can solve it, for example, with uh, a trivial algorithm that looks at all pairs and checks whether um, relations holds between them. Uh, but this will be quadratic, uh, and typically the data sets that we will have will be very, very large, and this cannot be done. Also, even, even if um, the data sets are, let's say, small and you would like to use a quadratic algorithm, uh, checking the pairs that is computing this um, dimensionally, uh, sorry, this, this matrix uh, uh, is a pain uh, because uh, in the case that uh, of geometries that are complicated, imagine geometries, for example, of a country that um, uh, has a um, uh, uh, let's say the uh, like Norway, for example, uh, where the area uh, towards the sea is uh, a lot. There are a lot of zigzags that make it such a beautiful country. Um, okay, um, so typically, then, uh, what algorithms, uh, or especially the linking algorithms like the ones that I will be presenting to you today, do, is they have a framework that uh, has two important steps. The first step is called filtering. Uh, and basically there, uh, we do some work to produce candidate pairs that are less than the Owen square uh, pairs that we would consider in the worst case, okay? And these candidate pairs are then passed through a verification step where we check where we check whether the relationship R holds. Uh, and in that way, we get the qualifying pairs that are of interest to us. Um, okay, so how do we do filtering then? Um, Let's take the steps, the previous steps one by one. How do we do filtering? And then how do we do verification? Um, in many of the algorithms that are in the literature, and actually these are the ones that I will be presenting to you today in more detail, uh, filtering is done using space tiling. So basically, we define an equigrid on Earth's surface. We index each geometry on this equigrid according to its minimum bounding right angle. And we define as candidate pairs only the geometries with MBRs intersecting the same tile. Okay, this is, I think, easy to understand. I mean, if geometries do not intersect the same tile, then there is no possibility that will be related in some way, right? They will be, they will be disjoint, and we are not interested in disjoint uh, relationships. Um, so this is an easy process, but, but of course, what we want to see how we can optimize this. So here's an example, actually. Um, so we take the equigrid, you see the equigrid, the various cells. Um, we index um, uh, not the, um, um, the geometries itself, uh, themselves, sorry, uh, but their minimum bounded boxes, which you can see here. Okay. And then you can see, for example, um, uh, down here that, uh, um, uh, here, for example, we have cell B31, okay, and we have uh, the minimum bounding box of G1 and the minimum bounding box of G2 intersecting B31. So it's quite possible then that, that these two geometries have some uh, topological relationship with each other. Um, and actually, they do. Um, uh, uh, as as we can see here. Um, so so if we actually uh, look carefully in the picture, we will see that we actually have three non-redundant candidate pairs, G1, G2, 
G1, G3, and G3, G4, uh, and no more. So there is actually a 75% um, um, lower, uh, these are 75% lower than the uh, 12 pairs that we would get if we, we could consider a brute force approach. Um, so this is a nice optimization. Um, and with respect to verification, uh, we already said that it, this can be done, um, but it might be computationally expensive. Uh, and there are actually good algorithms for doing this. Um, in the implementations that I will be talking about, we use the Java topology suite, um, which is a popular software uh, for computing the intersection matrix for pairs of geometries, and then deducing the topological relations that hold from it. Um, so let me now start presenting you algorithms uh, that have been implemented um, uh, in the literature. Um, we actually started this work back in 2016 with my colleague Panagiotis Meros. Uh, Panagiotis did his MSc thesis on this topic and he actually defined the problem. Um, um, so, so for the filtering step, um, he actually considered the static space tiling approach with a particular tile granularity. And for the verification step, uh, he used um, a parallelization of the procedure uh, and he got some very nice results that were published in a workshop. Um, then uh, Panagiotis visited um, for a period of time the, the group of um, Axel Cyril, um, uh, and Gonga uh, and Gomo, um, and together they wrote a paper on a new system called Radon um, that actually be beyond that actually went beyond the original system that Panagiotis had built, um, in the sense that in the filtering step they had the nice idea of not to do in a, a, a static space tiling, but actually actually taking into account um, uh, the geometries of the given data sets and, and uh, considering a dynamic space tiling approach. And for the, uh, so, so this is the, the, you know, the original uh, idea of Radon with respect to, to filtering. Uh, and for the verification step, we, they uh, had some relation specific optimizations. They managed to, uh, to eliminate redundancy by using hash tables. And they also had a nice multi-core uh, parallelization and the system that they developed, they, they made it available as part of Lines. And, and up to 2019, it was state of the art. Um, and they also developed a second system called Radon uh, 2 uh, that actually used the intersection matrix to compute all topological relations between two geometries uh, instead of computing uh, the geometries one by one. So this was an optimization, basically a, a very nice one. Um, we came into the picture again uh, last year in the web conference. Uh, we had a paper called uh, um, uh, an, an algorithm called Giant uh, for uh, geospatial interlinking at large. Um, and our idea was to uh, improve on Radon's filtering. Um, now uh, we do uh, dynamic space tiling exclusively on the source data set, based exclusively on the source data set. And we index only the source data set on the grid. Um, with respect to the target data set, um, we read the target data set geometries one by one from the, um, uh, from the uh, disk where they are stored. Uh, so basically in that way, we significantly lower the memory requirements. We also inherently remove um, the redundancy that has to do with repeated geometry pairs. So this was um, uh, basically the contributions, the original idea of um, a giant uh, with respect to filtering. 
Um, and um, in terms of verification, we are going holistic. So instead of computing um, the uh, geospatial relationships one by one, we compute the matrix and it ext extract them from them. And this is again, uh, gives us uh, quite some uh, lower runtime performance. Um, so, so here I have some uh, details of the algorithm. Um, so basically, uh, let's see, um, sorry, let's see here, I is the uh, equigrid that we want to build. So delta X and delta Y are the, um, uh, the, um, the size of the tiles in the equigrid. And then uh, we take each geometry in the, um, in the source data set, um, uh, each geometry SNS, uh, we get its MBR, uh, we get the corners of the MBR, uh, and um, uh, the, 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 the inside force for I and for J basically add this geometry to the appropriate cells of the index. So this is uh, the indexing part of the filtering step. Uh, uh, and then comes the verification step where we read uh, every geometry uh, of the target data set one by one from the disk. This is what the while uh, statement, the while loop here does. Uh, uh, and for each such geometry, we compute the MBR again. Uh, we see what tiles this MBR intersects, tiles from the grid. Uh, we get the geometries that uh, live in these tiles, these form this data set CS, okay? And then in the last for each uh, loop, uh, for uh, each geometry S and CS, uh, we basically look to see whether two, these two geometries have intersected MBRs. If they do, um, we see whether we compute the intersection matrix and we extract the um, uh, topological relationships that hold between them from that intersection matrix, okay? So very um, uh, straightforward algorithm. Um, uh, so, so with these very nice observations, we managed actually to go in terms of theoretical complexities quite to be quite uh, better than the state of the art uh, at that time. Um, um, so for example, if you consider here um, the filtering column uh, in the time complexity, um, matrix here, a giant is OS, uh, or rather O cardinality of S, where S is the, the source data set, and see that Radon is O cardinality S plus cardinality T, S similarly Radon 2, and then STLD, which is another competitive system that I didn't talk about, is O, um, uh, cardinality I, why I is the uh, equigrid. Uh, similar comments hold for the verification column and also for the space complexity column. In all cases, we, uh, we are better than the competitors. Okay, so this was the first um, part of the contribution that we made. Um, the second part, um, is, is actually more interesting in my opinion. And it brings um, a new idea, um, which is called um, a progressive geospatial interlinking. So what do we mean by this? Um, this is an idea which is ideal for applications with limited resources, either temporal, temporal or computational, that they, uh, so, so that these um, applications cannot um, 
wait um, um, for a long time to compute all the pairs that uh, satisfy a geospatial relation. So what we want here is we want to have an algorithm uh, as uh, shown here in the uh, in the x y uh, axis diagram, where the x axis shows us the number of verified pairs, um, and the y axis shows us the number of qualifying pairs. So we would like to have an algorithm that goes like the dashed line where the solid line is the batch approach. So the solid line is algorithms like Radon and Radon2 and Giant that I just presented. Um, but we want uh, an algorithm that will work in such a way that eventually, okay, uh, so um, here uh, at, this, at this point, uh, this algorithm would have computed uh, all the pairs of um, uh, all the pairs of um, uh, topological relations that that hold um, sorry uh, all the pairs that satisfy a topological relation. Okay, so eventually uh, the progressive algorithm will behave as the batch one. Uh, but the progressive algorithm will have improved early quality. So if we go at a point N and we stop there, then going up, we will see that the progressive algorithm has actually computed a lot more qualifying pairs than the batch algorithm. And we measure the performance of the progressive algorithm using what we call progressive geometry recall, which is exactly the area under the curve, uh, the dashed curve here in the picture. So how does this work? Um, the algorithm works like we show at the bottom of the slide. So there is a filtering step. Uh, from which we get the candidate pairs. And then there is a scheduling step. And the scheduling step actually has a mechanism to order the candidate pairs so that they are verified uh, selectively. Um, uh, so we verify uh, the, the pairs that actually hold more promise of being uh, qualifying pairs. Um, and so, so with this extra scheduling step, we have a progressive algorithm. Uh, and actually, uh, verification now um, uh, can be done in two ways. Uh, we can talk about static uh, algorithms, static progressive, where the order uh, verification is specified by the scheduling step. Um, but we can also have dynamic progressive algorithm where the order depends not just on the scheduling step, uh, but also on the outcomes of the pairs verified so far. Um, we will see an example in a minute. Um, and as we said, scheduling is the, is the step that actually defines the process in order of the candidate pairs produced by filtering so that to maximize progressive geometry recall. Uh, now to be able to, um, to be able to have a useful uh, scheduling step, uh, and to be able to select uh, which pair to verify first, uh, we need to somehow weight these pairs. Um, so, so we assign, uh, we need to find m m uh, ways to assign uh, weights to pairs uh, where a weight is analogous to the likelihood to satisfy for the pair to satisfy a non-trivial topological relation. 
Uh, so we have defined uh, two kinds of weighting schemes to do that. The first kind is uh, uh, the, so the, the heat probability schemes, as we call them, uh, and they consider exclusively the tiles shared by S and T. Um, so they basically assume that the more tiles S and T have in common, the more likely they are to be topologically related, um, and thus the higher should be their weight. Um, so this is the heat probability schemes and the complexity schemes then uh, basically uh, give more weight to pairs that will be verified um, faster, basically. So obviously they would give um, higher uh, weight to pairs of simple geometries, right? Because complex geometries would take a lot of time to verify. Uh, so now if you want to go into the details, um, in the heat probability schemes, we consider these three. We consider um, the co-occurrence frequency, uh, which basically uh, measures, uh, rather counts the number of common tiles then a normalized version of it, which is the Jacquard similarity, uh, and then another one uh, based on Pearson's uh, uh, high squared test, and the complexity schemes, we consider uh, the minimum bounded rectangle overlap and, and the inverse sum of points, okay, it doesn't matter, the details do not matter very much. And having these schemes now, we go and define a static version uh, of uh, a static progressive rather version of giant where we are given a budget a source data set and a target data set the filtering step works exactly as in the batch case the, um, and the scheduling step uses the priority queue where um, given the budget uh, we um, uh, weight uh, appropriately the candidate pairs and then the verification step processes the pairs of the priority queue in decreasing weight uh, and this is basically the algorithm. Um, and uh, we have also de defined a dynamic progressive giant uh, version where the core idea is that whenever a new pair of geometries is detected as qualifying we boost the weight of all candidate pairs that are associated with S and T and are still located in the priority queue, so they, they are verified earlier. Uh, an example of this can be the following. Imagine that, imagine that you are, um, you, you, one data set is um, very long strings that are, let's say, rows, and one data set is polygons that are buildings. Then once you get a road, um, uh, or rather, the more buildings uh, that have a topological relationship with a road, um, the more weight you give to other buildings, because maybe the road is a long road and it's gonna touch these buildings as well. That's the idea, basically. Experiments. Uh, we have experimented uh, with a lot of data sets. Uh, uh, here we give an example, uh, we give a, a subset of them. Uh, and as you can see, as you can see, we have data sets that start uh, from millions. Uh, in the in the column D1 uh, and go to uh, hundreds of millions in the of geometries in the column D6 uh, and and then as you can see uh, at the bottom of the table um, the qualifying pairs can be um, uh, are always millions. Uh, but the, the candidate pairs can be uh, hundreds of millions in the case of T6. So, so basically, um, 
uh, going up from D1, D2 to the other data sets, um, we have an increase in difficulty of uh, the algorithms being able to handle uh, geospatial interlinking in these data sets. And these data sets are either from the United States or from the whole world, and they cover things like uh, hydrology, uh, lakes, parks, roads, buildings, etc. So, so they are uh, real world data sets taken from uh, 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 spatial cartographic surveys. And now, if we want to compare what the uh, the batch algorithms do, uh, we can see here that, as we saw in the theory earlier. Uh, giant is actually better than Radon and Radon 2. Uh, giant is the last uh, row uh, in this table, and we are measuring uh, filtering time, verification time, and, and memory space. Um, um, so actually, Radon and Radon 2 can only handle data sets D1 and D2. They cannot do more. Uh, the other data sets are only handled by uh, Giant. So, so Giant is the state of the art at the moment is the, in, this, um, in this area. And now measuring, uh, moving on, we would like to measure the effectiveness of the progressive algorithms. And we have uh, here three measures um, to do that. Precision, that is number of detected qualifying pairs in the, in the given budget over the budget. Recall, number of detected qualifying pairs in the given budget over the maximum possible number of qualifying pairs in the budget. And progressive geometry recall, as we defined it as the area under the curve earlier. And here you can see that, um, let's see. This curve here is the optimal, okay? And you can see that the next better algorithm is the progressive giant. And then we have progressive radon uh, uh, and batch radon and, and giant. Actually, the progressiveness uh, is not a feature that is um, uh, shared only by giant. We also define the progressive version of radon to be able to uh, our algorithm, uh, but still progressive giant is, uh, is, is uh, better. And then we spend a lot of work uh, parallelizing uh, uh, the various versions of giant on Apache Spark. Um, so basically here, what we do is starting from the left, we store the, we store the source and the target data sets uh, on HDFS. Then we run the spatial partitioner of GeoSpark, um, which is an open source um, big data geospatial system. Uh, if implemented on top of Spark, uh, it has a, a a spatial partitioner based on quad trees that we use. Uh, and in that way, geometries end up in uh, various partitions. Uh, we make sure to join overlapping partitions uh, so that um, we optimize the, uh, the steps that we will follow er uh, later. Then, um, we, um, uh, I'm sorry, then the mapping stage basically uh, sends um, these partitions uh, to executors where the filtering step will run. Uh, here we have a technique called reference point that is necessary so that we don't have a redundant candidate pairs. I will explain this technique in a minute. Then we have the scheduling step in the executor in case the algorithm is progressive, uh, then the verification step, and then the reduce step of the map reduce algorithm collect, collects the results and, and uh, outputs them. 
So this is the main idea. I mean, for the details, you have to see the paper. Uh, now, what is the, uh, the reference point technique? Uh, the reference point technique basically says that, um, look, I mean, it's nice what we said earlier that if we have uh, geometries so that um, their minimum bound in rectangles intersect a tile of the equigrid, then it is possible that they are suspects, right? And they might have a topological relation holding between them. This is fine. But how about if they intersect more than one of such tiles? In that case, we're going to get these pair, pairs twice. And we want to avoid this redundancy. So there is a proposition, basically, a small theorem, let's say, that says that um, consider only the tile uh, where um, the reference point um, uh, exists. Um, and by reference point, uh, we define the top left uh, corner uh, of the intersection of the minimum bound in rectangles of the two geometries. So if we do that, we avoid the redundancy, as you can see here in this um, example with tiles B31 and B21, uh, G1 and G2 will only be looked uh, at uh, as, as a pair um, with respect to uh, tile B21, because this is where the reference point lives. Um, and we just, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt, we just have very limited time, so maybe if you can spend a couple of more minutes and then we leave some time for questions. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I, I um, messed up my time, I apologize. Uh, thank you, Elena. Uh, yes, so, so I can actually close it here, um, um, because um, uh, we also have results on the parallelization of it, these algorithms, uh, okay? Uh, that basically show that the parallel versions are uh, go competitively. And then all these um, uh, techniques uh, we have actually put together in a framework that we call Jedi Spatial. Uh, and Jedi Spatial actually has a lot more techniques than the ones uh, that I presented to you today here. Has techniques that are based uh, on other uh, ideas like spatial joins, for example, from databases. And you can view Jedi Spatial as a framework that has three dimensions. One dimension is the space tiling. And I show you uh, the ideas about space tiling today. Well, and the other dimension is the progressiveness. So you either have a budget or you don't have a budget. And the third dimension is the execution mode, whether you're going to have uh, your algorithm implemented in a single uh, computer or you're going to use some sort of system like Apache Spark. Um, so this is uh, basically uh, what I wanted to tell you today. Uh, thank you very much. And I can stop sharing. Thank you very much, Manolis. Are there any questions, comments from the audience? Um, Sherzad? Yeah, thanks, Manolis. It's uh, quite interesting and a lot of work as uh, effort that went into this research. I just want to ask you, besides algorithms, what are the possible use cases of these data sets? Like we have this all, all geospatial linked open data and so on. If you could just a little bit tell us about so that kind of connection to the events, so to say, how can we use this information like to maybe if it helps for event identification in the visual, obviously it's visual, obviously in this case, or also for geolocation, this kind of applications. 
well uh, the the use cases are many i mean we have um we have typically used these data sets um in the context of um uh, either uh examples like the one that we showed you uh, i showed you earlier where one data source might come from satellite images and another data source might come from elsewhere and we would like to interrelate these data sources uh, so this this is the typical use case that we had in various projects that we ran over the years um, so i remember for example that we had a, a precision uh, agriculture use case where we would like to uh, interlink um, uh, data sources that describe the natura, natura areas and data sources that describe fields so that to make sure that we don't have um, uh, um, let's say um, spraying of um, prohibited um, uh, things uh, in near the natura areas by the farmers um, so, so the typical uh, this would be the typical application but um, we have also been using it as a compilation step also so for example in a, in a geospatial question answering system that we have uh, we use geospatial interlinking to pre-compile uh, relationships that hold uh, between uh, the various knowledge graph sources that we have in our knowledge graph so that we can answer questions more effectively uh, during question time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much. Maybe one question connected to knowledge graphs and uh, do you think that semantic information because as far as i have seen so so far what you've shown is basically geometric matching right so but does semantic information associated with these geometries can help uh, this matching did you have a look at this type of questions okay um so this would be helpful for example um uh, if you would like to take into account as you say um uh, information which I suppose we will call it thematic uh, to, to distinguish from to distinguish it from the geospatial you call it semantic but I see your point Elena we are saying the same thing um, uh, for that we haven't done anything really um, so that would be useful uh, if I would uh, ask this uh, to my colleague uh, George Papadakis, who has been leading this uh, work. Um, I suppose you know George from uh, L3S, yes? Um, so George would say that it can be handled by just Jedi, uh, but I'm not sure if I believe him. So, so George has this Jedi framework that is just an entity resolution framework. Um, and then we did Jedi Spatial. I think that Jedi Spatial needs to also take into account the semantic information, but we haven't done that, Elena, so far. And there are certainly use cases for that, right? Uh, you might want to see, uh, for example, whether uh, something that you call um, Athens is the same with what I call Athena. Yeah, and for that, we might want to look at um, uh, information about the name, uh, but also information about the geometries. And notice, for example, that the name is very similar and the geometries are all, almost identical. So we are probably talking about the same place. 
Yes, I think it would be very interesting to somehow look on more details there because my impression is that like you, we either look at entity matching and we don't care so much about the geometry. On the other hand, we have this powerful framework which you developed to uh, look at the geometrical matching and then maybe combining this would be yeah, yeah. more useful. Mm, yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. So very exciting, interesting talk. And uh, just have a brief look if there are any other comments or questions. Uh, no, that doesn't seem to be the case. And thank you, Manolis. And thank you, Elena. Thank you very much. And apologize for my voice and coughing and everything. I, I just couldn't manage it. Get, get well soon, Manolis. <laughs> Yeah, okay. And uh, then we continue with our workshop program. So then we have a paper presentation by Sebastian Reinman and uh, Sarah Stumler. So let's see, can you, uh, Sebastian, do you want to share yeah. the screen? Yes, uh, I'll do that. So can you see the screen and the presentation? Uh, yes. Perfect. OK. Um, my name is Sebastian Reimann. And together with Sarah Stimne, I was working on cross-lingual transfer to counteract data scarcity for causality detection. Essentially, um, we defined causality detection to be a binary classification task to automatically find causal relations in text. Um, we simply define causal relations to be relations between a cause and an effect. And we also required uh, a certain causal connective to be present to make this type of relation explicit. The following sentence that is presented here in Swedish and English uh, exemplifies this, where we have one, um, one cause, namely thunder here, uh, one effect, fires, and one connective that then basically links uh, thunder and fires and shows the causality between these two. Essentially, our goals were here to investigate which type of multilingual pre-trained embeddings may be the most beneficial um, for this task. We also looked at uh, annotation schemes that so were coming from different annotation projects. Um, because data, as also mentioned in the title, is still relatively scarce for this task. So we needed to uh, yeah, take our data from different sources. And finally, we also wanted to investigate to what extent cross-lingual transfer for causality detection may benefit from, from additional target language data and training. Yeah, uh, English was unsurprisingly the language for which the largest amount of data was available. Here we took data coming from two different sources, one the uh, bin cause in 2020 shared task and the SEM EWL 2010 shared task. Um, here we were already able to observe one of the aforementioned differences in annotation because in the fin causal task, the notion of effect was much, much stricter defined uh, than in the SEM EWL data. So to take this into account, we created various combinations of the two data sets that are uh, shown here on the slides with one being a combination of the SEM EWL and the fin causal data, the fin causal and the SEM EWL data separately, and the SEM EWL data plus the positive the causal examples from the fin causal data. The other two languages that we were looking at in our study were German and Swedish. For German, we took our data from the causality data set of Riebein and Ruppenhofer. For Swedish, on the other hand, we sampled um, the sentences from a corpus of governmental reports. We draw specific guidelines for the annotation of the Swedish test set um, that are, were similar to the ones used in by Riebein and Ruppenhofer. Um, and yeah, on the other hand, the Swedish training set was annotated in a relatively quick annotation phase uh, without specific guidelines and without consolidations. So um, yeah, here eventually to get the uh, annotations of the three individual annotators into uh, final labels, we um, use two different methods, uh, numerical scores and a, th a certain threshold and a majority vote. This led to yeah, a relatively skewed uh, distribution of the labels, as we can see the table below, where the percent column shows the percentage of causal examples in the data. Um, 
Um, yeah. So additionally, we also uh, created a balanced version of the Swedish training set where we had fewer examples, but a 50-50 ratio between causal and non-causal examples. Um, we were using three different types of state-of-the-art pre-trained multilingual models, LASER, Multilingual BERT, and XLM Roberta. Um, when I'm going to present our results in a second, I will mostly focus on the results for XLM Roberta. Um, but of course, the results for the other models are presented in detail in the paper. We uh, applied two different uh, settings that involved cross-lingual transfer. One uh, was zero-shot cross-lingual transfer, where we were training on data in a source language and then testing on data in a different target language. Um, on the slide, you can see the source and target language combinations that we tried out. And we also um, yeah, tested few-shot cross-lingual transfer. That meant we were training on data in the source language plus a little bit of target language data and then testing on the target language. And here we did this with either uh, German or English as a source language and Swedish as a target language, but also we tested out uh, here uh, English as a source language and German as the target language, because um, yeah, essentially, um, yeah, we had much more German data available and um, that meant we were able to vary the sizes of target language data involved in the training process a little bit, and then we were better able to see the impact of target language data here. But back to uh, zero shot transfer for a second with English as a source language and German and Swedish as uh, target languages as presented in the table here. Um, it is interesting because when we were using the full uh, fin causal uh, set, including the negative examples uh, in our training data, um, yeah, uh, we can see a relatively poor performance, especially when it comes to recall. And yeah, um, one reason uh, for this may indeed be that uh, due to the stricter uh, uh, de definition of the effect term in the fin causal data, uh, the model eventually may have learned a much stricter definition and then failed to recognize a wide range of causal examples. Um, because when we exclude the negative fin causal examples, we clearly see that the performance goes up. Um, yeah. Another interesting detail is that when we were using the German data set uh, as a uh, source language training data, um, we get an even better performance compared to the English data set, even though we had much less data available. So only around 2000 sentences for German versus 8000 or more uh, with the English data. And so this could be because of the similarity in annotation guidelines, because when we are um, then again, including some of the English data, uh, we can see that the performance is already a little bit worse um, here. The so second uh, row of the table shows. For uh, few-shot transfer, uh, interesting, for few-shot transfer with Swedish as a source language, we were interestingly not able to see any performance, uh, any improvement in performance at all over the zero-shot scenario when we were using the two data set with the full 210 uh, sentences, uh, so the, especially the data set where the labels were then obtained through numerical vote uh, had a particularly negative effect. This could be because of uh, its skewed nature and um, it may have overgeneralized some aspects. And yeah, because when we were using the balanced data set, as we can see here on the table, um, we get a slight improvement actually. And yeah, for German as a uh, target language and English as a source language, it was possible to already observe, uh, yeah, big improvements with laser, uh, with uh, multilingual BERT and XLM Roberta uh, for small portions and a particularly good performance with a full set, but laser was not able to make much of that. So in conclusion, we could say that uh, minor differences between the models for zero shot uh, transfer were seen, but transform based models were better for few shot transfer. The different annotation schemes had an effect that additional target language data was mostly helpful, but caution needs to be given to data imbalance. And for future work, we suggest to observe transfer between more distantly related languages and to more closely observe these overgeneralization issues with multilingual BERT and XLM Roberta and future transfer. 
So that's it from my side. Uh, any questions? And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, are there any questions, comments? Um, maybe I can start. Um, thanks for your talk, Sebastian. It was yeah interesting and um, related to many topics that we are looking in the project as well. I just didn't get the part like um, can you maybe quickly kind of uh, yeah summarize. What was the effect of having a bigger language, uh, let's say data, like you said, German is the biggest one. And when you trained on that and you applied to Swedish or English versus the, like a similarity between languages, did you see which one is more important, so to say? Like, is it important to have, I mean, German and uh, English are from the same family, obviously, same for Swedish, right? So is it better to train on German for Swedish or is it better to train on Swedish for English, I don't know if you got, got my point. What is the effect of data size versus similarity between languages? Mm -hmm. I mean, um, that's actually uh, an interesting point. I mean, uh, uh, actually, uh, the English uh, data set was the largest one. Uh, maybe I uh, presented that in a bit of an uh, uh, hard to understand manner. I'm sorry if that's, that was the case. But uh, anyway, um, we. Uh, when it comes to um, German and Swedish, we did not see, like, uh, we actually looked at the results and we're looking at, yeah, we made some uh, analysis of some of the errors and we're looking for uh, some, like, uh, yeah, uh, the similarities between the languages were affecting some, of, or were leading to some of the errors. It was possible to see some points between English and German where there may have been uh, may have been confusion because of uh, the syntax uh, of German being much more different to English. But interestingly, we did not see uh, uh, anything like this better perform. We did not see anything that may have affected the better performance on Swedish when using uh, German as a source language uh, with respect to language similarities. Okay, I, uh, actually, I would have expected that. I don't know, maybe this is something. So if you use yeah. the same kind of a data size, I would say maybe Swedish is more similar to German than English. But yeah, you know, yeah. I think th this could be something interesting to look at. In yeah, and yeah, okay. also I think in general, maybe the, I mean, the, as I uh, mentioned briefly in the for the future work uh, section, it would maybe be interestingly interesting to also uh, for future work to look at completely different language and then see mm. yeah how much the, this similarity has affected the results here okay yeah thank you thank you very much then we will go to the next presentation so now we will have very brief talks of uh, the students from the uh, Cleopatra ITN. I would like everybody to please pay attention to the time. So we are planned for five minutes for the following presentation. So please also um, have a look at the watch when you present and focus on the main highlights. So the first we have presentation of Tim Kutzer. Tim, can you share a screen? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, just a moment. Moment. Share screen. Mm -hmm. There. And let me just find it. There it is. Can you see my screen? Uh, yes, but not full screen. Uh, yeah, now it works. Okay. So I guess I will start. So, hello, I'm Tim, and I'll be talking about the contextualization of event information through quotes. 
specifically as it relates to quote KG, recently accepted paper to appear at ESWC. So first, let me just talk a bit about invent information in general. So we have many suitable knowledge graphs for representing representation of nominal entities. So for this, we have like DBpedia, Yago, and Wikidata. But comparatively, events have been less addressed with knowledge graphs, but some examples include event KG and its extension OEKG. Below, we have a schema of event KG, which we can see how we can represent events through like participants or actors, uh, the location of the event, the time of an event. But one thing that I, uh, when conceptualizing this work, thought about is that it would be interesting to also represent events through quotes said about the event at a given time by particular individuals of interest. So for this, we have an example here in the second line via Schaffendas by Angela Merkel, which was a relevant quote at the time of, of the European migrant crisis. And it kind of reflected her future career as well as like um, what Europe did at the time uh, regarding this event of the migrant crisis. So just to continue on uh, to the methodology. So here we are using uh, Wikiquote. We are extracting, I, I will get to what exactly Wikiquote is and explain each of these steps to quote KG. So basically what Wikiquote is, is an online collection of quotes. It's a Wikimedia project similar to Wikipedia. It is written with MediaWiki markup. It has currently 67 languages and 270,000 pages. And on it, we have quotes. So it is, they, there are pages of topics where a topic may be either something like quotes about war, or it may be uh, basically quotes by a given individual. And we have these quotes represented in two different uh, ways. One is fairly unstructured. It would be the first thing we see here. Falling in love is not all the most stupid thing that people do. Uh, as we see, it's basically a string and we do have some contextual information here after the stars written on the margins of a letter. And the other representation is French here. Uh, where we have very specifically demarcated where a citation is, where the context is, what's the original and so on. So unfortunately, the consistency of data representation is not the same. So specific rules need to be made for specific languages. So, and that's what we basically did. So here there's an example of uh, the uh, quotes by Biden. So as we see, uh, on the top right, there are quotes, there are some links, but there is no specific uh, like delineation of where uh, the context information starts or if it's just a quote. On the other hand, below, this is also a quote by Joe Biden and we have as a subline, the context behind the quote. So what we do here is we focus only on pages of persons. So we're not extracting quotes about war, but quotes said by specific people. And we also place a minimum constraint of 50 quotes being found, 50 pages, excuse me, being found in a given language. So we don't end up with 67 languages because unfortunately there's not uh, many quotes for every language. So continuing on with the identification and enrichment of quotes, this would be actually our schema for quotes. Uh, so what we want to capture with quotes is uh, their mentions. So a given quote can be said in multiple languages, so English or French, and they may be translated directly or in the spirit of the language. We consider each quote to be a quote mention, and uh, a quotation would be like the clustering of quotes in different languages. And for all of this, we can extract different kinds of contextual information, such as the date, and uh, also the emotion and the other contextual things like which source published this quote and so on. So continuing on, we have cross-lingual alignment of these quotes. So we want to have them in different languages. And for this, we kind of frame this as a clustering task. We tried multiple uh, language models to cluster this. We eventually went with XLM Roberta. It has been trained on more than 30 languages and it has shown 
that it works with more than just 30 languages as it was like trained on uh, uh, well, it was trained on more than 30 languages, but they've evaluated it on 30 languages. In any case, we have some evaluation statistics here. It, we see that it performs fairly well with uh, high F1 scores and precision and recall. This is just a manually annotated ground truth uh, set that uh, we checked on uh, because there's no labels for this, obviously. Uh, and finally, we, went, we end up with quote KG, which would be a knowledge graph of quotes. We end up with 69,000 quotes, uh, sorry, 69,000 uh, persons uh, that have uh, said a quote. Uh, we have 880,000 quotes, and of those, uh, there are 960,000 mentions. So uh, as we see, there's not a lot of overlap between different languages, uh, because I guess different cultures find different, uh, different quotes to be interesting or different individuals to be of interest to their like cultural background. And what I wanted to say other than thank you is uh, uh, some impact in future work. So uh, because I didn't mention it before, we also uh, have misattributed quotes. So that would be uh, quotes that have been found to be misattributed to individuals. And of these we found 38,000. So uh, I think that would be an interesting thing to research in the future for like understanding propagation of false uh, or misleading information. And anyways, that would be it. So yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I was also wondering about the quality and did you also observe any differences across languages like these translations, let's say? Or... Uh, yeah, we... we... So uh, we ended up with 55 languages. Uh, this ex excludes languages such as simple English. So we obviously didn't want to have such uh, uh, confounders in our data. But as far as the difference in performance, we didn't really observe any difference. What we did find interesting is when uh, an English uh, author, for example, is much more interesting to some Middle Eastern nation than it is to English speaking uh, countries. So some poet might have like 150 quotes in uh, Persian and uh, maybe like 30 in English, uh, which we thought was also some, uh, maybe an interesting venue to explore for digital humanities. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think it's a very interesting source now that also to explore and to, because this linking gives, of course, much better starting point to have this information in a more structured and linked way. Uh, thank you very much, Tim. Very interesting work. Are there any other further questions, comments? Okay, doesn't seem so. So then okay. uh, we go to the next presentation. Our next speaker is Sara Abdallah. Um, hi, everyone. So let me share my screen. Uh, so uh, do you see my screen? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, so uh, my name is uh, Sara. I'm a PhD student in University of Hanover Altruist Research Center. And in Cleopatra project, I work on uh, developing user access models to uh, multilingual information. Uh, and in this presentation, I'd like to talk about uh, one of my uh, projects, language specific uh, event recommendation. Uh, so uh, let's start uh, with um, uh, talking about uh, the motivation behind this works. Um, uh, probably uh, you uh, all have seen entity recommendation results in, uh, uh, for example, in a Google search engine uh, when you look for information about uh, an actor or a movie and you, uh, other than uh, the uh, web, uh, web uh, document results, uh, you, you have seen probably uh, some uh, similar entities, some other actors and uh, movies uh, recommended uh, in, for example, in the right side of the uh, page. Uh, so these are the results of entity recommendation. And, and uh, these actually um, 
uh, helps the users uh, with web app, uh, navigation and uh, exploratory research. Uh, but here in this work, uh, the main focus is uh, event recommendation and uh, taking into account uh, languages. Um, the main reason behind it is that uh, event relevance is highly dependent on the language uh, context and uh, information needs of users. And uh, let me uh, give you an example uh, to make it more clear. Uh, let's say that uh, users uh, or some researchers are looking for information related to World War II or to perception of coronavirus pandemic. Uh, and uh, the languages, the language community these users uh, are living in uh, impact uh, the kind of information needs they have. And in this method, the language specific event recommendation, uh, we take the user's interest and their linguistic uh, background into account. So uh, this method uh, works with uh, uh, query and language as input, and uh, the output is a ranked community. Uh, one example uh, here again is uh, World War II, uh, and let's say the language is German. Uh, the first recommended event by this method is uh, uh, Aktion Silber uh, Streif. Uh, this uh, actually this event um, is largest German propaganda operation during World War II. So um, this event is related to World War II, but it is exactly related to uh, German community and information needs of German users. Uh, and now uh, let's talk about uh, our approach. Uh, in the first step, we start by uh, creating embeddings uh, based on a knowledge graph. Uh, which is language specific and be created from different uh, language versions of uh, other knowledge graphs. After creating embeddings, we extract features uh, from this knowledge graph and these features uh, represent events and their relationships uh, with other um, events and entities. And finally, we train a learning trend model uh, that learns from a language specific click data, uh, which is um, actually created from click stream data set. Uh, this, um, uh, uh, figure uh, shows um, our approach in more detail. Uh, here in the bottom, uh, we have background knowledge. We have our uh, language specific knowledge graph, which is created from different language versions. And uh, in the right side, we have our uh, ground truth, which is uh, created from a click stream data set. In the training phase, we create uh, embeddings, we extract uh, features from our uh, language specific knowledge graph, and uh, then the, we train a learning to rank um, algorithm. Uh, and in query phase, uh, given a query of user and the language, uh, we use the embeddings in the training phase, uh, which is created previously, and we create a, 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 candidates uh, and having the uh, features from this query entity and candidates and using the learning track model, every uh, recommend events uh, based on the uh, input uh, entity, input query entity and the language. Uh, and um, due to the time limitations, uh, I uh, like to directly uh, talk about some uh, results. Uh, here I prepared some uh, results based on this um, method. Uh, here the uh, query user queries film festival, and we have uh, sorry, and we have uh, recommended events uh, for three languages: German, French, and uh, Russian. And, and as you can see, uh, the recommended events uh, are different in different languages. Uh, for example, for German, uh, the second recommended events, uh, which is International Short Film Festival, uh, Oberhausen, which is a city uh, in Germany, or we have a Munich International Short uh, Film Festival for German. Uh, for French, we have uh, different uh, Cesar Awards or uh, Lumia Award. Uh, which is exactly uh, German, uh, French specific. Um, and for Russian, we have uh, All Union Film Festival, uh, Moscow International Film Festival, and uh, Window to Europe, uh, which is uh, also, uh, it's only uh, existed in uh, Russian Wikipedia. And uh, we translated um, the title of the, uh, this film festival, but uh, it is also uh, Russian uh, specific. Uh, Event, uh, Russian specific event uh, related to a uh, film festival. Uh, so that was it. And uh, thank you uh, uh, for your attention.
Uh, thank you very much, Sarah. Are there any questions, comments? Okay, does not seem to be the case. Well, I think there is one question from Manalis. He raised his hand. Oh, okay, please go ahead. But I don't know. He... Uh, Manalis, did you have a question? Oh. Actually, the guy was clapping, not having a question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Good, thank you. So it's, it's difficult to see here with this Zoom view the uh, questions like and uh, that. So if someone wants to say something, also please speak up because uh, I, I don't see the whole list of participants at once. Okay, so we are a bit over time. So I would suggest that we have uh, one more presentation and then maybe we make a break so that we are um, not completely out of skill. Um, and Gabriel, who's the next one? Yes, hi, it's me. Uh, let me just share my screen here real quick. Can you all see this screen that I'm pointing to right now? Right here. Yeah? Yeah, we Hello. can see. Cool, okay. All right, so hello everyone. My name is Gabriel. I am a PhD student at King's College London and I currently work with assessing the quality of knowledge graphs, specifically Wikidata, and specifically through multiple languages. Um, first, and because we're short of time, I'm just going to jump right into it. Um, first, we define and assess the quality of Wikidata. Uh, Wikidata, for those who don't know, is a large knowledge graph, uh, which is multilingual by nature, and it involves uh, information about entities. Um, Wikidata itself, focuses on references, not on the truth. So in Wikidata, the data actually doesn't need to be true. It just needs to be backed by references. Of course, then being true is, is important, but it's not a crucial um, part of the deal. Um, this is taken directly from its uh, verifiability guidelines and with some exceptions in general, statements in, in Wikidata or information in Wikidata should be relevant, should be true. I mean, not true, but backed by references. So it should be relevant. Uh, its sources should be authoritative and they should be easy to access by some users, right? This is not um, accessible in the genre of, of, uh, of, of uh, disabilities and all. It's easy to access in the, sense of, in the sense of actually people being able to see the information. What we do to measure these three things, so we have relevancy, authoritativeness, and ease of access, um, is this is a big um, workflow, but I'm just going to resume it for you. We take it from a data, a sample, big enough, and representative of uh, multiple types of information. And we pull it through a crowdsourcing uh, step. Basically, we put it to people on the crowd and we ask them if these references are relevant, if they are authoritative, and if they are easy to access. And we measure that, right? And we do this across multiple languages. So we do this with a large enough um, scale that it has a 95% confidence interval, 5% margin of error. And we do this for six different languages, uh, English, Portuguese, Spanish, Japanese, Dutch, and Swedish, because they are somewhat equally um, distanced in the language distribution of Wikidata. So we, of course, we have English right on top, and then um, languages like Japanese appear only less than a half percent of times in references. Um, Wikidata, it's, it uses two main types of references, right? So it has, a, it has internal references, which is, it just circles back to Wikidata. So the source of the statement is, it, it's an item inside Wikidata itself, or at least something that that item represents. And the external reference is something that takes you directly outside of Wikidata. So it's a URL, it's an ID for some website, it's something like this. Um, most studies so far have only focused on external references, just like URLs. So what we do is actually we also include the internal ones by resolving a URL for them, finding in the internet something that you can go to that represents that item, right? That in that works for like 95% of times because they are um, normally, as we will see here, um, um, they are internet resources. So the way the references are encoded in Wikidata, they use multiple different predicates or properties, right? Um, the one that is used the most is the stated in property, which is the property that specifies um, the source 
for internal references. So it's used the most. Then retrieve, which is just when it was retrieved to time. So that doesn't really matter for us. Then we have reference URL, which is this, the, the property that defines the source for external references. So it points directly to a URL. And then we have these IDs here, which are in white. Um, so they are also external, but they just tell you the ID. They don't tell you how to use this ID. Um, what we did was, is we picked these two, stated in and reference rel, right? So this is internal, this is external. And for the stated in sources, for the internal sources, we see that most of them um, are academic and biological things. So era PubMed, which is uh, for um, publications in, in medicine, uh, Crossref, NCBI gene, uh, protein uh, databases. And if you see here the kinds of sources that they are, they're most uh, normally open access repositories, databases, digital libraries. So they're all digital things. So it was pretty easy to find a URL for them. And the reference URL is already a URL. So we don't really need to do anything with them. Uh, we just also see here that they're basically just, again, more academic um, uh, sources like uh, EBI, which is for uh, biology, uh, and CBI, which is again, biology. So we crowdsource these um, references. I mean, we, we, we measure their relevancy, their authoritativeness, and their ease of access. Uh, we use two different tasks, tasks. The first one just asks if they are relevant and how easy it is to find the information. The second one asks what are the types of author, publisher, and, and sub-publisher, uh, publisher subtype. Um, what we saw, and this is already the results, is that 90% of, relef of references are relevant. They actually have the information they said they should be, uh, they, sh they should have. Uh, and this varies a bit across languages, right? Uh, most languages, most of them, are fairly to very easy to access, uh, except for English. Um, English isn't. It actually is pretty hard. So almost 20% of them are zero, which is extremely hard to, to, to find information. And this is because it's mostly academic data that English um, contains. Um, these are the barriers. So I, here I have uh, some um, legends, but I'll, I'll, I'll just go uh, quickly through it. So Japanese references here, you can see here, 65% here in this class, I have a huge problem with uh, pages not being available. Most of the references in Japanese and Wikidata pointed to Yahoo, which is out of commission. So that doesn't work anymore. Um, most barriers, they don't actually occur anywhere, but in English, you see, it's basically 0% everywhere. But in English, uh, there, is, there are huge barriers, uh, mainly security issues here, and also uh, domain knowledge and paywalls. And also most barriers, most frequently, they're just lack of information. It's just actually people don't have enough information to actually find what they need to find when they go to the, re to the reference. Um, these are results about um, just authoritativeness, and we see that um, most, here, uh, most references in English are actually academic. 83% of, of all references in English point to academic sources, uh, as opposed to basically all other languages, which is like 1%. The highest, the second highest is 21% Spanish. Uh, so this is a very big bias. Um, the main takeaways out of this is that Improving the representation of provenance in Wikidata is very needed. Needed, um, so where references point you to and the, the quality of them. Um, Wikipedia references, which is something that Wikidata doesn't like to use, they are the most easy to access. So 77% of, Wiki, of Wikipedia references are like four out, of, four out of four, the easiest to, to, to find information. And they are the most relevant. 98% of them are relevant. They're, so basically, they do a very good job, but they're not authoritative because they're made by um, a community that is um, uh, that is anonymous. Um, okay, I'm that. sorry. Uh, we are very short of time, so if you sure. can just yeah. uh, summarize in two sentences your conclusion. Yeah, sure. So that's the main takeaway. Uh, relevance is the hardest to verify. Um, it is very tied to trends and content, so different languages will have different contents themselves. So that's why they're different in quality, um, and that's basically. It. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, are there any questions, comments? Okay, so we are a bit, thank you very much again, and um, we are a bit, uh, yeah, over time now. So 
uh, we need to restart the session at 10.45. So I would propose that we now make a short break of, uh, let's say, six minutes. And then we, uh, we planned two more talks uh, now in the session. So we will move them to the uh, point after the break. So we see us again at uh, five minutes, more or less, and uh, then we will continue with the uh, talk of Elizabeth. Hi, everyone. I'm Elisabeth Kutsiana. I'm a second year uh, PhD student, and today I'm going to talk about part of my work, uh, talking Wikidata and rediscovering knowledge engineering in Wikidata discussion pages. So a bit about my research in Cleopatra. Um, my research is um, about the role of discussions in collaborative knowledge graphs. Knowledge graphs are graph-shaped knowledge bases that integrate data from various sources. Uh, Tim introduced part of it in the beginning. Um, and they can be built collaboratively uh, by a group of people online. So my case study is Wikidata, another uh, Wikimedia project, like Tim present the Wikiquote. And um, my data set is the discussions between the people who built Wikidata. The aim of my research in general is to uh, find what are discussions used for, who is using the discussions, and uh, how do uh, they impact participation. But today I'm going to talk only about the first um, question, what are discussions used for? So the objectives are to find um, how these discussions are used, what are the main topics and um, how these discussions can support knowledge engineering activities. Um, knowledge engineering is, uh, refers to the study of um, con constructing a knowledge basis. Our methods were a descriptive statistics and thematic analysis. Thematic analysis is a qualitative method. It helps us to manually read uh, a sample of discussions and uh, extract information, assumptions about the themes. And uh, our data um, for this research are uh, item talk pages. Items are the main building blocks in Wiki Wikidata. We can think uh, um, the items as the articles in Wikipedia. And talk pages are uh, a place for uh, contributors to discuss about the items. So our main results were that actually editors do not often use item talk pages, only 0.02% of items have talk page. And if we compare with Wikipedia, where 28% of articles have a talk page, uh, it's a very low percentage. We also found that uh, the existing talk pages follow a parallel distribution. Uh, with an overwhelming majority of uh, talk pages include only one post without response to, to the discussion. And that long conversations improve items quality score. We can see here in the histogram, if we can see my, um, uh, how I point the, the last group of bars, more than five posts refers to the talk pages with more than five posts. Uh, present better quality, the A, the blue, um, dark blue bar. Uh, from the thematic analysis, we were able to identify the main topics of discussions. Uh, so editors uh, mostly discussed about the knowledge graph curation. This is the maintenance of the knowledge graph, how they edit items, how they extend uh, these, um, these pages in Wikidata. But they also discussed about fact accuracy, taxonomy building, policy, and also connection with the other Wikimedia projects, especially Wikipedia. Uh, we did not in the, uh, find any indication of intensified conflicts uh, in Wikidata talk pages like we can find in Wikipedia with all the edit wars. Finally, looking specifically about knowledge engineering activities in those discussions, um, we find that um, editors do discuss about knowledge engineering and um, they discussed about uh, domain analysis. Uh, this is when, for example, they need to specify uh, how to capture the domain. For example, if we talk about uh, wines, they need to, to identify the terms. Uh, wines can be whites, they have class of uh, classes of whites and reds. They talk about conceptualization, starting to, to write a, in a piece of paper, for example, um, uh, what are these terms? Uh, implementation, 
the translation from this uh, text to a computer readable uh, language. And they also talk about maintenance and evaluation. So to be short, the main takeaways are that um, uh, to improve the quality of items, maybe Wikidata need to pay attention to this large portion of talk pages without responses. And this maybe can be done uh, with better instructions for the use of those talk pages. And finally, now that we know that knowledge engineering actually exists in discussions between editors, maybe a more specific area for these discussions could enhance their collaboration and the improvement on the knowledge graph. This is for me. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, are there any questions in the audience? Okay, doesn't seem so. Okay, thank you. Next talk would be by Sahar Ahmad Sebi. Yes. Hello, everyone. Uh, let me share my screen. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Uh, well, I'm Sahar. I'm an ESR uh, in Kilopatra project working in TIB Hanover. Uh, my work's focus mainly is about multimodal fact validation. And today I'm going to talk about uh, detecting misinformation in uh, multimodal claims. Okay. Uh, if we want to have a quick problem definition here, I would say by multimodal fact validation, we mean uh, given a multimodal claim, which for now is an image text pair as input, uh, we want to predict whether the claim is real or fake. And uh, in this way, we use uh, multimodal features extracted from claim, and more important, we use related evidence retrieved from uh, some related source. And uh, we feed this evidence to our model as an external knowledge. Here, uh, this is an example of what I mean, which shows a uh, tweet text and uh, its associated image. Uh, this claim is originally fake, but what's important here is that why it is fake. So we need a system here to predict the veracity of a claim and uh, be able to interpret its decision with some evidences uh, which shows why this, this claim is real or why it is fake. And uh, for example, in this slide, we need a system which can detect this image is related to another event. And usually this will achieved by uh, considering the related evidence. And that's an important gap in existing methods uh, in this field, which we are trying to address here. OK, uh, these are the data sets that I'm currently working on. Uh, they're both related to a challenge named verifying multimedia use, which was held in uh, two years. And uh, the data sets consist of uh, tweets and their images. And uh, one important point is that the text here is multilingual in both of them. Well, uh, as a first step to reach the final goal, I, I uh, started with a multimodal fake news detection system. And uh, the difference here between uh, this problem and the previous one is that here we don't include evidence and uh, we just do the classification only based uh, on multimodal features which extracted from the claims and uh, after having this model in hand uh, the next step would be to including evidence so uh, this slide shows the informations of baselines models which uh, I implemented so far. And uh, each of them use a, uh, uses a, uh, an image encoder, a text encoder, a combination method, and uh, a classification architecture at the end. So let's see some results here. OK, this, uh, this slide shows uh, some results which I achieved till now compared to other baselines. 
and uh, the row in gray color are related to the methods uh, which are which uh, use additional features than text and image uh, and since they are not fairly comparable with our baselines uh, i separated them somehow and uh, as you can see uh, the method names clip mlp has the best performance in most cases and um, in regarding both data sets, both 2015 and 2016. Uh, yeah, that, that was a quick overview of what I did so far. And uh, now I'm doing some analysis to, uh, to better detect models behavior when you do the classification only based on uh, features alone, the extracted features from the claim. And in the same time, uh, right now I'm, current, I'm working on the finding the best way to retrieve related evidence. So, thank you. Okay, thank you, Sahar. Um, do we have any questions here? Okay, doesn't seem so. Thanks for also being on time. So we could uh, go with the next speaker, who is Andrew Kachupai. Andrew, could you please share your screen? Yep, hi everyone. Mm -hmm. You can hear me, yes? Yes. Okay. okay, so you can see my screen, yes? yes? Yeah. Okay, so yeah. Hi, everyone. My name is Andri. I'm also a PhD student uh, at the University of Bonn. So today I'm going to present, uh, I'll just introduce uh, one of the topics I've been working uh, throughout my PhD. And then uh, at the very end, I will show just the uh, <clears throat> what's the progress uh, from my PhD and so on. So, okay, the topic is conversational question answering over knowledge graph. So first of all, we'll start with uh, question answering over knowledge graph. So the whole idea is that given uh, a natural language question and a source uh, knowledge graph, we want to uh, find the subset of the knowledge graph intended to be the answer uh, for the question. So what we mean by that, we can see an example. So. Uh, we suppose that the user um, poses the question, where was the president of the United States born? And then we have uh, our QA system or computer, which has established a connection with a knowledge graph. It can be, uh, sorry, it can be uh, DBP, the Wikidata, Yag, or Freebase. And for the particular question, the idea is that we first want to identify the main entity, which is United States. And then we want the head of state, which is Joe Biden. And then we want to identify the place of birth of Joe Biden, which is uh, Scranton, Pennsylvania. So this would be the answer uh, for this particular question. Now, what usually happens is that the uh, information is not always satisfied in one shot uh, processing. So the user will with, with, uh, either uh, issue a follow up, uh, a series of follow up questions to, uh, let's say, clarify things regarding the first question or uh, whether uh, they want to uh, further explore a particular topic. So this is uh, similar to um, search, se search sessions and uh, interactive uh, retrieval. So basically this happens because the user wants to simulate uh, a natural experience with the assistant. And uh, of course they will, tend, they will tend to leave uh, unspecified context in the follow-up question. So we will see an example for that also. So yeah, so for our previous example, the user now can uh, continue with another question, where did he graduate from? And we see that this he refers to uh, uh, Joe Biden. Yeah, but Unfortunately, Joe Biden is not uh, part of the, uh, let's say, uh, context uh, from the previous term, the question and the answer, but uh, we should have some sort of a memory with entities where we can uh, uh, store, uh, where we can store all the entities and then we can uh, index it. So this is, here we need to perform some sort of uh, co-reference resolution to identify the entity Joe Biden and then uh, from this entity, we can explore the graph and we can see that, okay, Syracuse University is the answer and then we can return this answer to the to the user and then this can continue. For example, what year it was established, here it's a bit more easier because we see that uh, it refers to the entity from the uh, answer A2. So what year it was established, it refers to Syracuse University and then we continue to explore the graph and then we see, okay, we find the year and then we can return the year to the user. But of course we can have a um, some other type of questions, uh, for example, um, how about Harvard University? So here we can see that the user provides the, the entity, but it doesn't uh, provide any additional uh, context on what exactly uh, uh, the user wants as an answer. So here we have to basically extract this context from the, uh, from the previous terms of the previous interactions. 
where basically the question here would be uh, what year was uh, Harvard University established, something like that, yeah. So as we can see, if we continue to explore the graph, we have to uh, identify something like that and then uh, uh, basically, yeah, just return the, the year. So this is what I've been working with, see different challenges on this uh, conversational question answering scenarios. Uh, most of them, uh, we have to go with some sort of uh, co-reference resolution or uh, let's say for the last uh, question we have, uh, we need to perform uh, ellipsis resolution. So we, uh, yeah, we have, um, in, in overall, we have unspecified uh, context uh, in different terms. And uh, yeah, so this so conversational question asking is one uh, of the topics that I've been working throughout my PhD. Another one is uh, answer verbalization, but the whole idea is that uh, we don't want to return just, uh, let's say, the entities as answer, but we want to uh, verbalize in, uh, in natural language. And uh, uh, yeah, uh, this have some sort of uh, advantages, let's say, for the system, but also for the user to better understand. So now I will just show a bit of, uh, for my PhD uh, thesis. So basically I have, uh, let's see, a main research questions, how we can employ multitask learning to improve the performance of conversational question answering over knowledge graph and answer verbalization. And we see three uh, keywords or topics. One is multitask learning, one is conversational question answering, and the other is answer verbalization. So basically I have these two topics of conversational question answering and answer verbalization, and I'm trying to uh, improve them, let's say your advanced state of the art using multitask learning where of course I have to show the challenges that we have to face, some of uh, those I mentioned before and so on. Uh, yeah, just last slide, just the contribution. So uh, yeah, I, I will not go into detail the research questions, but uh, the whole idea is that uh, each of the contributions uh, will provide some sort of uh, um, solutions, let's say for the, for the particular field. And um, yeah, I think that's all from my side. I should be all, all ready five minutes. Yeah, right. thank you, Andre. Um, any questions, the audience? Didn't seem so. Okay, thank you, Andre. And we'll go with the next uh, presentation by Gulal Chima. Gulal, can you share your screen? Gulal, are you there? Okay, I would suggest then let's go with the next and then we can come back to Gulal again. Next would be by Goza Tahna Sepzadeh. Goza, can you please share your screen? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, unfortunately, my camera is not working. Uh, I'm sorry. Okay, no problem. Just uh... okay. I will share my screen. Mm -hmm. Okay, go so please start. We are running out of time. Uh, I'm sorry, I started sharing and my microphone uh, stopped working. Okay. Um, then maybe you can figure it out in the meantime. Maybe I, I think we should go with the next because we are running out of time. We'll come back to you after maybe. Daniela, can you maybe take the turn? Yes. Great. Let me just then share my screen. So again, reminder, please, in five minutes. Yes, thank you. So my, um, sorry. Oh God. Uh, 
Uh, so my name is Daniela. I'm an early career researcher at School of Advanced Study, uh, and my uh, I'm going to talk a little about the challenges that I faced when uh, gathering my data and trying to make sense of my data. Um, and this is going to culminate in a, um, a close and distant reading approach. So uh, my thesis uh, is a thesis in contemporary history because as it's mentioned here, it concerns the events of the last 16 years of European history. It concerns the idea of Europe as an historical construction and it concerns the uses and appropriation of history in the media discourse. Now, the main issue for me was how to historicize uh, 16 years of recent history across eight newspapers, uh, two languages, and over 60,000 articles. So put it simply, how can I make sense of all this data in a way that's meaningful? And how can I devise patterns and trends um, in a way that's more than just superficial? So the first thing I tried was topic modeling. But the problem with topic modeling is that it is not only does it have confusing clusters, but actually, if you are in familiar with the data and familiar with the events in this case that that are concerning the data, then topic modeling becomes quite predictable. So for example, this is um, topic modeling for The Guardian in 2019, and Brexit is a uh, one of the main one of the main clusters, and then the deal the, the the deal between the EU and the UK, and and it's all very internal UK politics. And if you read the Guardian in two thousand and nineteen, you would have known that this was true. You don't really need topic modeling to tell you this. Um, and and so uh, topic modeling didn't really help, other than just giving by just giving me a, a very superficial overview of the data. So what I did then was to kind of it was using a more far more rudimentary process, which was going through the top words and the top bigrams in my data and creating my own categorization uh, based on my previous knowledge of the data and my previous knowledge of the events that and people that were around European politics at the time. Um, so what happened, what I did here was, um, so this is for 2019, and I created this, this categorization, which includes uh, institutions, political parties, events, people, postholders, places, concepts, nationalities, collectives, and currencies. Now, I think obviously that name entity recognition would do very well with some of these categories, uh, particularly with people and places, but there are other um, terms that appear in my in my data set and appear quite often because this is the top 50 bigrams so they appear with with some regularity in in the data um, that I think um, algorithms that name entity recognition algorithms would have uh, would have some difficulty in in uh, recognizing and particularly because some expressions are written in ways that are not as straightforward um, and they sometimes the word the, the order of the words changes. Uh, when it comes, for example, to concepts, it gets very difficult to to understand what the concept is. Um, you know, it get it's it's not necessarily easy for an algorithm to understand what the concept is. So, for example, art, Article Fifty might mean nothing, but I know that Article Fifty is a mechanism is the mechanism that allowed um, the the lawful mechanism that allowed the UK to live to leave the to leave the EU. Um, and uh, so there's a lot of other expressions, for instance, not in this uh, example, but in, two in early 2004 and five, for example, that relate to immigration. And the way the, these expressions appear in my bigrams, for example, I, I, it, it's very subjective because there's a lot of adjectives that go with it. Um, so for instance, bad immigrants or good immigration. And, I, and that is a very important concept, but it doesn't really, uh, it, it doesn't, it wouldn't necessarily be recognized in name entity recognition. Um, so the benefits of this is that I actually get much more detail and in-depth information. Uh, and the data is more relevant because it's organized according to amount of times the word or the biogram appear. And then it, because of this, it becomes much easier to compare years and newspapers, uh, like here, for example. Um, so this is actually, this actually offers me a much more detailed information and much more detailed insights than topic modeling, um, because some of these things, some of these events that appear here did not appear in topic modeling. So for example, the orthographic agreement or second referendum. 
Um, and the original characterization also affords the researcher much greater control over the data. Uh, so I was actually able to rely on my own categorization and my own ideas about the data rather than an automatic process. Um, and this, in my case, this was actually quite good because I managed to combine a close reading approach uh, by going through the, the different, the different um, words that appeared in different biograms and trying to figure them out and device patterns and then created a categorization that, um, that fitted that. Um, and so in conclusion, for digital humanists and social scientists, the control of the data is very important and quantitative research should not detach the researcher from, the, from becoming familiar with the characteristics and the specific specificities of the data, including first and foremost, their content. Thank you. Great, thank you very much also for being on time. <laughs> I don't see any questions, so let's uh, continue with Kolal. Thank you, Daniel, again. We cannot hear you, Kolal. I would suggest you figure this out again and, and let's continue with Kolsa. Kolsa, can you share your screen? You hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so, okay. Um, so, my name is uh, Gosa. I'm uh, going to present uh, contextualization of images and news sources. Uh, so, first, we have this motivation. Um, in the context of news, uh, the key part of a document is four W elements who, when, where, and what. So here, uh, the goal of uh, contextualizing images is to extract uh, background information about the image, such as events, locations, entities, and the date. But why images are important and why do we need this background information? Uh, the widespread of uh, online misinformation is a threat to the information ecosystem. And uh, existing studies demonstrate that users usually have high priority in getting news about uh, specific places, such as their working country or their hometown. And uh, as you know, a picture is worth a thousand words. So associated pictures are a complement of news text and provide readers additional information uh, or help them get information quickly. Now I'm going to present one of our papers in this regard, uh, which was uh, accepted in uh, CIGAR 2021. Uh, so the title is uh, Geolocation-Based Wiki Image News and Event Retrieval. So billions of images are appearing every day on the web. Uh, so one might be uh, encounter an image while surfing the web and might be interested in uh, where it was taken and what are similar places or what kind of events happened recently in that place. But finding keywords to search on the web uh, would be hard in this case. So uh, in this work, we want to show how content-based geolocation estimation of images helps simplify uh, the search and uh, enhance the results. Um, so the main goal of uh, the system is to close the gap between geolocation estimation, information representation, knowledge graphs, and information retrieval. The system is composed of a front end and the back end. Uh, the front end has four panels, an input, input panel and four and three other uh, panels for the results. And the uh, backend uh, includes five modules. In the next slide, I will explain more details about them. Uh, 
so given the input query image, the geolocation estimation module predicts the geocoordinates. To this end, we applied the model proposed by muller budek et al. This model is uh, based on ResNet and it's uh, trained on Flickr images. Then the predicted latitude and longitude are given to the uh, entity retrieval uh, module. Uh, the input radius and the entity types given uh, by the user are employed to query Wikidata. Uh, so this module uh, gets uh, these three inputs and retrieves entities of the specified types and uh, located in the selected radius of the um, coordinates that are predicted. Then uh, we use uh, Wikimedia Commons links to download the images. Uh, the entity ranking module gets the downloaded images and uh, ranks them based on uh, similarity to the input query image. We use uh, four different uh, visual embeddings to do that, geolocation embedding, places embedding, object embedding, and uh, finally the con con concatenation of all. Uh, so uh, finally, from the retrieved entities, uh, uh, the user can select uh, one uh, from the map to get events from Open Event Knowledge Graph and news from Event Registry. So we applied a small evaluation on this uh, to see uh, if the system works. So we used the Google Landmark dataset. We grouped the images into 12 distinct groups, including the most frequent entity types. Uh, given the Wikimedia Commons Im image um, as a query, uh, the goal is to see uh, if the system can retrieve the corresponding wiki data entity. Here in the table, you can see that 84% of the test queries are ranked top 10, 76% are uh, ranked uh, top uh, five, and 52% are ranked uh, top one. Overall, um, the results show the feasibility of the whole system for different types of uh, landmarks. As future uh, direction, um, since our system fails for some uh, images to find uh, news or events, in the future uh, work, we plan to use additional resources and also we plan to include uh, more entity types and more advanced input options for the user. For example, textual descriptions or keywords to improve the uh, retrieval task. Uh, so I want to um, show some results if that's possible. So do you see the demo or no? Yes. Uh, so on the left side, you can select the image or upload one. Uh, here you can select the type of results, for example, these two. And here you can select the radius of the results and uh, you click uh, predict. Uh, here I ran it to save time. Uh, so uh, on the map, you can see the retrieved entities, which are the blue uh, ones. Uh, here you can see the predicted geo coordinates and the ground truth. Uh, so if you select uh, some entity on the right side, you can see uh, the background information from Wikidata, which is uh, Notre Dame, news articles, and on the bottom, you can see the most similar places. So that was it. And yeah, yeah. Uh, here also, I forgot to say that you can run it on your phone. And yeah, that was it. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, thank you, Valsa. Um, I don't see any questions. So let's continue. Gulal, can you able to share your screen? Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, but the volume is fine, right? Yes, it's awesome. Okay, so I will not turn on the video before anything stops working. So I'll just continue like that. Can you see the screen? Yes. Okay. So, hi, uh, my name is Kulal. Uh, okay, I'll wait for it to load first. So, my name is Kulal, and I'll be presenting my work, uh, recent work on the uh, topic of claim detection, and uh, which is a uh, sub task or a sub uh, category of work in uh, fake news detection. So in, in this line of work, uh, uh, most of the work starts with a definition of a claim. And if it's a simple text uh, uh, or any text uh, for that matter, a claim is basically a statement or an assertion uh, that something is the case and typically without providing proof or with proof. So some cases, uh, recent work has focused on uh, claims from Twitter, and these are some example of claims uh, from tweets, where one tweet can be uh, that uh, some person, some prominent person said something, which is a claim, and uh, it should be checked whether this person said this specific thing. Uh, some uh, other claim can be that some event got cancelled, and this is a tweet from uh, a New York Times uh, 
Twitter handle. And this is also a claim which should be checked. Then uh, another tweet where uh, some pro uh, prominent organization or a country is testing cryptocurrency to boost its, uh, to boost its econom uh, economy, uh, which is a relevant claim and uh, which should be checked as well because it can cause uh, uh, changes in the stock market, rise or lows, and people can follow and create uh, rallies over the stock market, which, which is why this tweet should also be checked for uh, whether it's true or not. And another kind of claim where uh, a tweet or a claim refers to a record, and the record is not given in the tweet, but it could be linked as a link or uh, through the image. So these are the kind of different claims that uh, are often on social media. Now, uh, since COVID-19, several data sets and challenges have come up uh, that are focused specifically on uh, detecting claims and detecting checkworthy claims, which could be uh, which could go viral and cause uh, further misinformation uh, among communities, among countries, and cause different kinds of troubles. Uh, for example, sniffing something to cure coronavirus or drinking something to cure coronavirus. There have been several instances uh, on internet, on Twitter, uh, like these. So these challenges and datasets have focused on one or two related topics, mostly COVID-19 and a related topic to that. And, uh, and it has focused on several languages, including English, uh, Arabic, Spanish, and a few more. So here, uh, with claims on Twitter, the challenge becomes that uh, the, no uh, the text is not a, uh, a clearly written text as you would find on Wikipedia or a book or something uh, uh, on a report. The, no uh, the, can, the text can be quite noisy it can be uh, it can be an arbitrary it can have an arbitrary structure uh, and different styles depending on uh, who writes it and then uh, another challenge is multiple modalities and in this line of work uh, most uh, work has focused on only text and not any other modality until now so our motivation is that claim detection is one of the key steps in fake news detection and this is like a preliminary preliminary step to check whether this uh, statement is uh, important or could uh, could be could be containing misinformation and it should be flagged to be properly checked by a uh, uh, by an individual or by uh, an authority so with images in claim detection there can be quite a few different uh, kind of images for example here the claims are uh, like the five uh, small steps written here and these are obviously verified or uh, like proper steps but you could imagine having some arbitrary statement which would not uh, be useful uh, to do, reduce the risk of coronavirus infection and people could follow it and this is one kind of uh, important information which could contribute as a claim in the image another could be like this image, which is an arbitrary image with a, with a quote or with a statement from some institute. And this is, should also be checked uh, for uh, because it also constitutes a claim. So another uh, kind of image where the image actually acts as an evidence and the claim is kind of in the text mainly an image acts as an evidence. So this is also another relationship between image and text here. And Another kind of claim where image is like a stock photograph and uh, the text is, uh, is the main claim. So these are kind of different relationships uh, in multimodal claims on social media, uh, Twitter specifically. So to address this, we uh, propose a new data set with a variety of claims, uh, primarily on three topics of COVID-19, climate change and broadly technology. We crawled uh, a pair of tweets and images and annotated them as uh, these three different types of claims. And at the end, we got about 3,400 annotated claims, uh, annotated samples, and had about 82,000 unlabeled samples in the data set. So what we did was we did an in-depth evaluation using state-of-the-art unimodal and multimodal models. And we found that multimodal models show promise, but it heavily relies on information extraction uh, from image for which we employed a simple step uh, uh, of OCR, optical character recognition, to uh, extract text. And that's how we got a better performance uh, in addition to a global image feature, usually using a CNN, uh, convolution neural network. 
And here too, the, uh, the challenge in this data set would be the variety of images. As I showed you, uh, uh, a variety of information in the image, for example, text, in addition to uh, visual information, and the nazi Twitter text, as it is usually the case with uh, Twitter claims or Twitter text. So in our future work, we would focus on finding relations between image and text, for which we also have annotations uh, for further analysis. And then we would also focus on, uh, focus on richer modality specific representation, extraction, and learning uh, methods. As, as from this work, we got this paper of uh, data set papers got accepted in the NSEL conference, which is a premier conference for uh, computation linguistics. And we also have a paper last year, which was extending existing uh, claim data sets with images and that got accepted at the uh, Cleopatra workshop last year. And that's it from us. All right, thank you, Gulal. Uh, we have to continue uh, with the next. Uh, it's by Kayo Melo. Kayo, could you please share your screen? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. A bit low, but maybe if you can increase the volume. Can you please start? So we cannot hear you. Maybe in the meantime, you figure it out and we have to come back to you again later, like in the next one. Okay, I already are back. We cannot hear you. Okay, Abdul, let's start with you then. Let's continue with you. And okay. yeah, please keep uh, it to five minutes. Screen. Uh, okay. Do you see my screen? Yes. Okay, hi everyone. My name is Abdul. Uh, I'm a PhD student in Joseph Stephen Institute, Slovenia. And the topic of my presentation is new spreading barriers. Here is the outline. Uh, I will present my work uh, in three parts. In the first part, I will explain an overview of my contribution uh, I have made for this topic. And then I will uh, present an overview uh, of a prototype that I have built to visualize the new spreading and a methodology to analyze different barriers and a novel topic modeling technique. In the last part, I will explain my current and future work. So let's move on to the contributions. I developed a methodology to analyze different barriers. Uh, I use this methodology to in, uh, to analyze influence of different barriers uh, using different type of events. I proposed a novel topic modeling technique and its evaluation on recent event, COVID-19 pandemic. And one of the uh, major research question uh, was how COVID-19 pandemic was reported by the media across a different political and economic contexts. I also defined the task of automatic barrier profiling uh, based on metadata. Uh, where I am currently applying uh, classical uh, classification models and deep learning methods. Uh, I developed a prototype using a processing ID for multilingual temporal cascading analysis. Uh, this ID is used for prototyping interfaces and services in, re in different research laboratories. Uh, my prototype takes a news article uh, in form of pairs as input and gives us an overview of cascading structure. Basically, uh, this prototype answer the, the question, how much information propagates across different languages over time? On the right side, you see the uh, figure of this prototype. Uh, it contains spirals or circles. Each spiral or circle uh, means a time span. 
In my case, this each spiral is one month. Each dot is a news article. The color of the dot is uh, uh, the language of the news article in which it published. And the link between the two dots means the information is propagating between two news articles. I use this prototype to uh, analyze three different type of events, earthquake, FIFA World Cup, and global warming. And I looked in, in significant happenings uh, in the figures by going into the text of the news article to see what is happening in cross-lingual uh, news articles. For monolingual uh, case scanning analysis, I use force directed graph, and I uh, find I found uh, largest case scanning chains uh, in each language for each event to see uh, the influence of the event or in which language uh, the in the news article are you know publishing more uh, for a specific event. For economic barrier, I compared uh, different economies uh, based on information spreading. Uh, uh, for three different events. For geographic and time zone barrier, I used uh, Google Maps to see the distribution of the news articles and news publishers. Uh, and I also uh, see uh, the news propagation uh, across different time zones using core diagram. I proposed a new topic modeling approach uh, that used basic LDA, uh, but with uh, one to six word and grounds, and it based on pooling of news article. Uh, it takes a news article as input, filter them based on user queries, and then perform topic modeling. And then we analyze different political and economic uh, issues there. So uh, we take a use case of COVID-19 pandemic and define five different queries. And uh, see the, here in this, uh, in this slide, I've shown uh, the, the differences with pooling and without pooling of coherence score. And we can see there is a significant difference. The red color bar shows uh, without pooling coherence score and purple color bar shows uh, the coherence score with pooling. Using this proposed technique, uh, we find uh, political differences in news reporting across different political alignments and economic differences is in the news reporting across different economies. Uh, in conclusion, I would, I would like to say I, I propose a novel topic modeling technique and uh, find economic and political differences. And I, uh, uh, I developed a methodology to analyze different barriers. And now uh, I'm working on automatic barrier profiling to, to improve news spreading. It can assist newspapers and it can also be used by researchers to know the reasons of different barriers in different communities. And, and that's all from my side. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Abdul. Um, yeah, we have to continue. Unfortunately, I, I don't see any also questions. Kaya, could you please share it again? Or should we continue with somebody else? Um, yeah, And for others who are in the call, it, it, for the ones who have to present, it helps to join via Zoom, not uh, the web application. I think many people had issues with those. So if, you, if your turn is next, um, please consider using Zoom. Okay, Kaya just joined. Hi, Kaya, can you hear us? Okay, so I would say let's continue with uh, Swati, and then we'll come back to Kayo after. Hello, uh, am I audible? Yes. Is my screen visible? Yeah. Okay, then let's continue. So good morning, everyone. I'm Swati, and for today's presentation, I'm going to briefly present the topic evaluating and improving inferential knowledge based systems for bias prediction in multilingual news headlines. A headline is said to be politically biased if it embodies the journalist political ideology. Identification of such bias in headlines is a very crucial task. Although looking at the headline spotting such bias is very challenging as it is usually short and may not contain the context of bias embedded in the article. 
We can see that in this example of news headlines reporting on the same event from opposing political ideologies. To compensate for this lack of information, inferential common sense knowledge, short for uh, IC knowledge, can be employed in a way similar to how people use common sense knowledge. Um, like uh, there are uh, a lot of research for going on this direction and uh, uh, here is an example of atomic common sense inference type that can be extracted using neural models such as Comet. Uh, for example, for the headline, Trump's awful advice on voting toys, the acquired common sense knowledge provides an inferential context as evident in this example. So I see knowledge can be employed to aid the comprehension of news headlines. However, without proper emphasis, the additional inferential context is prone to introduce unnecessary noise. Thus, the task is to build a model with an emphasis on important inferences only. Here we can see the outline of the task. Uh, in the absence of any large scale data sets for determining this political orientation in news headlines, we generate three data sets that's media bias, good news, and ER news bias. So we generate the first data set media bias by utilizing the bias labels uh, of the news headlines from the bias rating portal that is all sides. We generate the second data set good news by extracting the headlines and their associated bias values from the data set good news everyone, which is based on a bias rating portal that is ad from this media. And we generated the third data set ER news bias by first including the bias label of the outlets from the bias rating portal media bias fact check. We then use event registry to extract the news headlines of the selected outlets. And here is the abstract representation of the uh, framework. And it begins with the extraction and refinement of the knowledge followed by the process of feature extraction and then important inferences are selected and fused with the headline to finally product the bias, predict the bias. And if we use the neural language mo knowledge model that is Comet, that is trained on atomic knowledge graphs to acquire the IC knowledge, we use the same model with the translate, retrieve, translate strategy for headlines in languages other than English. And this complete figure illustrates the flowchart of the IC knowledge extraction process. And to render it more meaningful, we combine the retrieve uh, inferences into a single statement describing the properties of the person involved as depicted in this example. And for feature extraction, we use sentence word. And since not all of the extracted inferences were equally important, we measured the importance of each inferences and then use the selected IC knowledge for the task of bias prediction. We discovered that proper IC knowledge selection improves the prediction performance. We also observed that incorporating IC knowledge, the model improves the understanding of the inferred meaning and makes the prediction guided by that. We discovered that uh, we discovered the cases in which IC knowledge is useful. For instance, for short headlines, headlines containing metaphors, satire, sarcasm, domain-specific slang words, or headlines with significant entities that are devoid of contextual information, IC knowledge appears to be useful. Additionally, we also defined the uh, instances in which including the IC knowledge adds literal no value. For instance, uh, in this case, when it is comprised of generic information, when it is devoid of significance, or when um, full knowledge overpowers it. So in this example, in correctly predicting the ideology of this headline, the world's knowledge, that is the Libyan National Army, is associated with the left wing, is more important than the IC knowledge itself. So here's the summary. To summarize, we employed IC knowledge to aid in comprehension of news headlines. We introduced a model to predict political bias in news headlines using IC knowledge with emphasis on the important inferences. And we presented the data sets and results on the models with and without IC knowledge boost. We also conducted a comprehensive error analysis to determine the scenarios or cases where the inclusion of IC knowledge is advantageous and when it isn't and why a model makes a prediction based on what. 
And in the future, we plan to investigate the additional knowledge bases and their impact on the prediction of political bias in news headlines. We would also like to explore the other inferential uh, knowledge bases. And uh, uh, I mean, we would like to see if uh, such inclusion improves the prediction or not. And we would also like to uh, enhance the selection and fusion technique. And that's all, thank you. All right, thank you very much, Swati. Um, let's continue with the next. Kayo, are you audible? Can you hear us? Yeah, I think it's gonna work now. I'm just... All right, just try it then. Thank you. Can you see my slides? Yes. Great. Okay. So hi everyone. My name is Kayo Melo. I'm a PhD student in digital humanities at uh, um, this school for advanced study. My thesis. Uh, I'm looking at the media coverage of the Olympic legacies of Rio and London games. I'm interested in understanding the different ways in which the concept of legacy is understood and narrated online. Today, I will present part of my research developed in the UK web archive at the British Library. This research uh, project's main objective is to make sense of the data collected by the UK web archive to understand what it can reveal in terms of the impact of hosting the games in the UK and London in particular. So for Gratoin Pro's legacy is planned and unplanned, positive and negative, intangible and tangible structures created through a sporting event that remain after the event. To navigate in the archives and build the data set to start this research, I have used Shine. It's a tool to explore an open access collection in the UK web archive. I searched for articles on Olympic Legacy London via Shine and selected among 10 domains provided by the platform, three news websites, uh, BBC, Guardian, The Independent, one official government website, UK Sport, and one activist blog, The Games Monitor. Uh, to summarize the data processing, I have the three images you can see below. The first one is a Python script to collect the articles from Shine and save them as text files. The second shows the main problem I had while searching for texts. Sometimes Shine doesn't provide uh, results, uh, just the text where the words such as appear in the article. In this example, Olympic Legacy is mentioned in a sidebar, and the article does not cover the topic that we are interested in. Finally, the third is about cleaning the results and excluding articles that do mention the Olympic Legacy of London, but not as the main topic. In this example, uh, the article is about the Athens Olympics. So an important stage that's worth mentioning here is the duplication. Many pages extracted via Shine are duplicates. It was important to remove duplicates to avoid errors in the word counts performed later on the next steps. The data from the articles uh, was ranked and the top 50 bigrams mentioned in the text were transferred uh, into a spreadsheet using the natural language toolkit. The list of trends was then used in a first distant reading to give a sense of the most discussed topics and then combined later on with a more qualitative approach of close reading for a deep understanding of context. So let's move on to the qualitative analysis. These bigrams have revealed a significant difference in the way the Olympic legacy of London was approached by different sources from 2004 to 2020. Among the most uh, cited bigrams by news publishers are young people and school sport, both referring to the promises included in the legacy plan of London. However, uh, the drop in the number of 16 to 25 year olds playing sports after the games was one of the main topics highlighted by the media. While both young people and school sport are a response to the legacy plan published by the government, the most mentioned bigram in the list of texts analyzed did not receive much attention in the document, and it was the West Ham. The destiny of the Olympic Stadium became one of the most controversial events around the Olympic legacy of London. Initially, the disagreement on whether it should remain as an athletics event or be handed over to West Ham uh, United drew the attention of the media. The dispute between West Ham and Tottenham for the Olympic Stadium and the threat of becoming a white elephant shed light on the place as a symbol of London's Olympic legacy. The media coverage of London's legacy contrasts with the much more abstract and bro broader bigram found in the text published by the British government, International Inspiration. Articles published by the UK Spot have revealed this focus mainly on the International Inspiration Programme, a project to promote sports in the sum of the most disadvantaged communities in the world. 
While the media seemed to be looking for internal issues, the government was targeting international audiences. The choice of the word inspiration references a much more immaterial and abstract idea of legacy that contrasts with the very concrete discussion around the Olympic Stadium, for example, hosted by the media. Looking at the backgrounds obtained from activist blogs, the, concern, the concerns are shown to have been more local, targeting primarily challenges faced by citizens of East London, the area where the Olympic Park's located. Among the main backgrounds are Stratford City, new jobs and public housing. The community focus approach highlights a significant discrepancy between the framing of the event in these different platforms. So these are preliminary steps to understand the multiple ways in which London's legacy was understood and narrated online. Uh, the different perspectives indicate a distance between immediate public interest, much more anchored in tangible legacies, and governmental official communication with a much more intangible and abstract approach. The Summer Olympic Games are hosted every four years and by a different uh, city bringing together its promises to be an uh, urban development catalyst and also the past events frustrations understanding the communication processes around the Olympics fundamental for the future planning of effective legacies that correspond to the interests of the nation's citizens. Thank you very much for watching this presentation. All right, thank you, Kaio. Um, we have to continue. Uh, next presenter is Diego. Diego Alves. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, hi, Diego. Okay, hi. Um... Let me share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, so hello everyone. Um, today I'll be presenting um, my study on typological approach for improving, improving dependency parsing. Just to start a, a quick reminder on what dependency parsing is. Basically is the NLP task uh, that is used to identify for each token in a sentence uh, its uh, head and its um, syntactic function in the sentence. So, for example, in this sentence I'm showing this slide, uh, for the token I, the head is the verb prefer, and uh, its syntactic role in the sentence is a uh, nominal subject. As for other NLP tasks, the dependence parsing today's state of the art is based on deep learning uh, method which generates the, the problem of um, availability of <clears throat> enough data in order to have satisfying results. Um, some approaches have, have been done to improve the, the, the results. And one of them is combining data from different languages. Uh, what has been shown that uh, combined languages using linguistic features can be helpful. But sometimes uh, there are some results that show that genealogical typology related to families uh, linguistic families does not explain uh, all the results obtained. For example, Irish combined with Indonesian has some interesting results. So my objective is to identify which synthetic features in terms of word order uh, are relevant uh, for this strategy of combining languages to improve uh, LOS result, or results, uh, which is label attention and score, uh, which is the, the percentage of uh, accurate assignment of uh, head and the dependence relation. The data I've been using is uh, the PUD corpora, which uh, is a parallel corpora uh, containing 1,000 sentences for 20 uh, different languages with a, a high degree of a linguistic uh, uh, variety. Uh, what's also interesting is that with this uh, parallel corpora, we can avoid bias of uh, size of uh, corpora and genre. Um, also, we uh, we are using some uh, high resource language that's English, French, but in a low resource scenario, which is the, the most relevant for the, this strategy of uh, dependency sparse improving. For the methodology, what we are using is we are comparing languages. What I'm showing today is two different uh, types of comparison, one more qualitative using uh, language vectors provided by lang vec uh, vectors are composed by 41 synthetic features, features in this database, which is more qualitative. And the second strategy is uh, 
language vector composed by the relative position of verb and object. What we see here is the distribution for the PUD languages. And we see that uh, for some languages such as Hindi, Japanese, Korean, and Turkish, they are uh, exclusively uh, object precedes the verb and Chinese objects uh, follows the verb. And for other languages, we have more a distribution of these patterns. And we can see here that German is the, the most uh, different one with a more balanced distribution between the two cases. Uh, we compare this uh, classification in, in terms of distance of vectors with the parsing improvement using UDFI, which is a deep learning tool. And uh, in UDFI, what we did was we combined languages two by two, combining the training uh, sets of, of the languages. With both uh, language, uh, the distance between the language vectors and the, the delta uh, in terms of LAS for dependency parsing, we calculate the experiment's correlation uh, and we compared the uh, strategy using the relative position of verb and object and the strategy using only uh, length to vec uh, language vectors. What we have seen is that here uh, in green is the values that are lower than minus uh, 0 0.5, which indicates uh, a, a moderate correlation. Um, what has, uh, is also important to, to be seen is that using Euclidean uh, distance between the vectors uh, and the uh, verb and object uh, strategy, we have eight cases where the correlation functions. As we can see, German is, as an exceptional language, uh, does not uh, follow in this. And English and Italian, which are uh, well-researched languages. So at least for the, the low resource scenarios, this correlation seems the, the most uh, relevant one. Just a uh, few words. As I said, this quantitative analysis of verb and object positions seems to be more relevant when comparing the languages. And uh, the perspective is to continue using other uh, linguistic uh, synthetic uh, features, also concerning not only the, the surface uh, synthetic, but also the deep uh, synthetic structure of sentences. Some references and if you have any questions thank you very much yeah thank you diego um i don't see any and we have to continue so the next uh speaker is gaurish takar gaurish could you please share your screen yeah uh, just give me a minute can you see my screen yes Okay, uh, so hi everyone. My name is Gaurish. I am from University of Zagreb, Fofa Zaga, and the topic that I'll be presenting is learner sourcing for sentiment data creation. So uh, learner sourcing, uh, so why are we doing uh, learn learner sourcing is a form of uh, crowdsourcing where student learners represent the crowd that engage in a meaningful uh, learning experience. Uh, the reason uh, why we are doing this whole process is because usually in the faculty, there are courses that are run by linguistic teachers that uh, after a particular course give tasks to their students to see how much they have learned. Whereas all these exams generate a lot of answers from the students, they kind of are a resource for a low resource language, for example, Croatian. So. Uh, in this overall setup, we use the students which were part of a course to kind of get a, a data set, data sets uh, for Croatian. So these are the four steps that are usually present in learner sourcing. That is that identification of individual learners contribution to NLP, like what can the learner contribute to the field. Second is uh, designing of the pedagogically beneficial activity. In this case, it is sentiment analysis at a sentence level. The third and the fourth step are like technical solution to aggregate and integration into an online user. Uh, usually using a, a, a MOOC or a, a annotation tool in combination to uh, aggregate all the results. So 
uh, in this setup, we, we ran uh, two tasks uh, for the students. One was sentiment analysis and machine, learn, machine translation task, but I'll be more focusing on the sentiment. Uh, so uh, the linguist, uh, we use the linguistics students and the information science students uh, to engage a sentiment annotation task and empty task. Uh, they were, uh, these goals were connected to three courses. One is language engineering, translation, and computer and corpus linguistics. So we had a, a, a crowd of, of 62 students, which were between the age of 22 and 24. So uh, for the first trial, uh, for the first trial, we extracted 216 reviews from uh, a website called Resenzie Filmova, which is a Croatian website, which has a lot of reviews about movies uh, and we, we chose adventure as a genre because we wanted students to kind of like feel, uh, enjoy the task in other way. And then we split it into, uh, we split the overall corpus. Uh, we pre-processed the corpus into the sentence and the, sentence, and the sentences were split in 18, 18 groups such that we had uh, a odd number of uh, annotators. Uh, we prepared a detailed uh, annotation scheme and annotation guidelines uh, with five categories, uh, positive, negative, neutral, mixed, and other. And we said if uh, there is any uh, figure of speech, they can kind of put it in other, whereas if the sentence has positive and negative, they can put it in the mixed category. We used a, a web interface called Inception that helped us keep the uh, students from one group, not see the sentences of other group and calculate the inter-rater agreement. After running this campaign, we collected the, uh, uh, the feedback from the students, like how much time did they take or uh, the pre annotations that they that were provided with the data set. Did they have any problems with that and, and uh, comments and suggestions. This helped us track the overall uh, view of the student towards the task. Uh, as a final, as a, as a final, after uh, computing all the uh, feedback, uh, we come to the conclusion that uh, uh, that uh, recruitment of students uh, helps in uh, development of data sets for low resource language. This helps students to kind of uh, uh, reflect upon their learning, which they learn in their linguistic courses, and in other in other way, in other way, it gives. The, the data sets that they have annotated are like uh, uh, data sets for the low resource languages, this provision, and for building more better machine learning models. Uh, we also asked like, what was their overall take? They found that the instructions were clear, easy to follow, and then they also ended up giving some better suggestions. And uh, we found that the overall inter-rater agreement was around 59, which is like moderate. And yeah, that were the results, but we didn't, didn't stop at this. Uh, we went on uh, doing more data sets. Uh, for example, we have enriched an existing Croatian Senti News data set that was a uh, document level data set for Croatian news. We got uh, a sentence level of that out of the same uh, uh, workflow. Then uh, the Croatian movie reviews for adventure was 216 that was done in this campaign, but we also have gone further for series and sci-fi. Sorry for the typo. We also have a, a parallel uh, English IMDB uh, Croatian data set with sentence level tag, but the size is around 5K. The original IMDB data set is like 25K, if I'm not mistaken. And then currently we are working on uh, Croatian reviews about the worst and the best places in Croatia, which are 30K positive, 22K negative, uh, which are phrase level uh, annotations. That's it. All right, thank you, Gaurish. Um, now let's continue with uh, our next and the last talk by Alberto Olivieri. Alberto. Uh, hello to everyone. Give me a second. Uh, are you seeing the presentation? Yeah. Okay. So this study is about image circulation of Russian state-controlled and independent media. 
um, for this, uh, uh, this is a preliminary feasibility study, and we analyzed the images published by state-controlled and independent Russian media outlets. Uh, we had uh, three main research questions. Uh, the first one was, to what extent do state-controlled Russian language media and independent media have uh, separate image spaces? Uh, which images uh, circulate on Yandex and do not circulate on Google and vice versa? The presence of absence of those. Uh, and are lastly, are Google and or Yandex censoring the war special or special military operation in total or uh, um, only for certain images and to what extent? Regarding methodology, uh, we used uh, this study um, by the Calvert Journal to select uh, the outlets, uh, but we also considered the changes that the Russian media landscape experienced since uh, this study. So we selected the uh, Radio Zvoboda, Medusa, BBC Russia, and Novaya Gazeta as independent media, and Argumenti Facti, Cosmo, and Rio Novosti as uh, state controlled media. <clears throat> uh, then we carried a mostly quantitative research with the addition of open source intelligence techniques. Uh, our first step was to select and download the 40 images from DK, the contact, and Instagram to determine which images we had to select as indicator we choose the highest number of interaction. The images were collected one for each day from the 16th to the 22nd of March. And subsequently, each image has been loaded in reverse image search, Google.com from the Netherlands and Yandex.ru from Russia. Uh, we used the VPN located in Moscow. We used the uh, Cybercoast VPN. Uh, to make sure that our own machine could not influence the outcome of the reverse image search, we used the incognito mode present in Google browser. But for further studies, we suggest using a clean virtual machine that will add more layer of protection from any tra tracking whatsoever. Once each image was loaded, the presence and absence of the images per engine were determined. And these are the preliminary results. Here you can see the total number of identical images found by the two search engines. As you can see, Yandex returns uh, substantially less results than Google. Uh, most, imp most importantly, you can see that the images taken from independent media return significantly less results. This difference is narrowed on Google images, even if it's still present. And most importantly, Google returns many more results than Yandex uh, from both groups of images. <clears throat> uh, here, uh, focusing on the images, we notice that most of them seem to be less violent than those used by Western media, specifically the ones published by set control media seem to return a filtered version of the conflict. This is just a quick overview and uh, temporal evolution of those images. Uh, preliminary results. Uh, regarding the first research question, it can therefore be stated that the state control and independent media did not share common image spaces. No identical images of the conflict were ever selected during the seven days under consideration. Concerning the second question, it can be stated that all the images of a state controlled media circulated on google.com, while three images of a state controlled media are not present on yandex.ru. Moreover, four images of independent media do not circulate on google.com, and 14 images do not circulate on yandex.ru. Finally, with regard uh, to the last resource question concerning possible censorship of image circulation by Yandex and Google, the study seems to suggest that Yandex.ru uh, filters image circulation more than Google.com, but uh, further studies are needed. We had some limitation, of course, this, is, this was just a preliminary study. Uh, the results are only preliminary, and therefore we can obtain statistically significant results. We will need to increase the number of analyzed images and that of media outlets. And uh, here you can see briefly other limitation. Uh, for future research, uh, we should consider adding google.com reverse image search to the sample related to Russian and adding yandex.com reverse image search to the sample related to the Netherlands. This uh, procedure would be useful to determine if there are some unseen biases in the search engine that we haven't considered during this preliminary study. We should also develop an in-depth uh, qualitative analysis, also employing in a more significant manner uh, OSIN techniques. The sample uh, size issue could be addressed increasing the number of images collected. Uh, a sample of 706 would provide 94% uh, uh, confidence interval with plus or minus 5% margin of error. To achieve this, the number of media outlets could be expanded and using images with the superimposed text should be avoided as it could provide a limited number of results on Google and Yandex. 
And that's all. Uh, thank you for your consideration. Yeah, thank you, Alberto. So with this, we come to the end of our um, presentations. Um, Elena, are you there? Yes. Um, yeah, I also would like to thank all our speakers for today for the uh, very interesting presentations of uh, research that we have seen lots of aspects of uh, event-centric processing and uh, different fields, also image analysis, NLP, knowledge graphs, all the whole spectrum, and these are very inspiring techniques. Um, I think what would be very nice also is to maybe have a group photo for the, uh, like to remind us about the workshops. So, um, it's when we speak, we typically have, you know, this like, list of black screens with names, but uh, I, I ask everybody just to switch on the camera for a moment. We could maybe just make a screenshot with everybody in it. Um, so let's see. Uh, Share that is a way how we can make like another view and maybe take a screenshot when um, I think two people are missing still. Yeah. It's one hour, but in the end we are recording the video, so we can also take it from the video, but I'll take a screenshot anyway. Yeah, but I think there are different views, right? So you you can have this kind of set everybody shown like in mm. one screen I just yeah so there is a gallery view at least for me ah gallery view yeah true ah yeah 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 i think so daniela uh, can you also do it sorry just a moment because i'm having some problem with my video Okay, so one, two, three. Yeah. Let's do one more. One, two, three. All right. Thank you very much. Okay, um, yeah, so Sharsa, do you want to say something? Yeah, I just want to thank everybody who was here today, our basically Cleopatra students, as well as our speakers, keynotes. So I think this has been a great workshop. We introduced our side as well to the community. And yeah, so thank you a lot also for the organizers. If anyone is here, it also took a while to organize this event. Um, I wish it, it would have been in person, but given the circumstances, this is also a good option still to have it. And yeah, so I look forward to seeing our students as well in other events. And besides that, yeah, thank you and have a nice uh, conference for the rest of the week. <laughs>